do need to do this base. So maybe we'll do that now. It's a little switch over from brushwork. Uh, we did the, the bases for all the nomads for this Operation Ice Storm. We did like this, right, where we did the little floor lights. I don't think those are supposed to be. I don't know what those are supposed to be, but we made them like little LED lights in the floor. So we did these with a blue glow on them and then the metallic kind of gray with the, the teal or green stripes on them, those jade kind of floor stripes on them. So that matches really well with all of the, the red guys, right? So the base is a good way to bring colors that you normally wouldn't put on the model itself. So, you know, like the nomads are primarily neutral grays and blacks and then reds. So to get other color on the model, I put them on these floors so I could get some green and blue in there. Um, for the uh, Pano side of this, very different because the Pano are all blue and neutral grays and whites. And so we painted the floor lights in red so we could pop a little bit of color on on the base that we don't have on the model to kind of balance out the hue and the temperature of the model all together. We have a little bit of warmth on the model with the non-metallic gold and the brown on the uh, on the holster there or the scabbard for the knife. But other than that, it's it's pretty neutral colors. And then the splash of blue and this little splash of the radiant green on the OSL of the little lights and doohickeys that they've got on them. Um, but not a lot of, of color variation, right? So we've made everything interesting, but then the little red glow OSL on the lights really brings it all together and gives you the ability, the yellow hazard stripes on some of these guys give you the ability to add more color in. So that being said, this corporate security unit is not part of either of these armies necessarily. Um, it's a mercenary unit, so it doesn't have to be on either one of these bases. So I'm thinking I'm gonna do her base completely different. Because right? this raw base here is for this guy, the sniper. As soon as we get the sniper to a point of pseudo completion, which he's really close. I could pop him off right now and, and put him on that base and, and be happy with it. So we may do that afterwards. Uh, show you how I clip all that stuff and drill the base out. So that's his base. So she needs a base of her own. And again, like, you know, I'm always telling people, like, as you're painting a model, kind of look at it and say, okay, what colors am I, not necessarily what colors am I missing, but what did I not choose to use on her? Obviously, she has no reds. She got the purple, but she's got no reds. So we could do something that had reds in it if we wanted to. Uh, it also has these little lights. So we could do the, the red glow of the lights on her. Um, we've got only a little splash of green on her. We've got some yellows and oranges. We've got, obviously, browns and flesh colors. Uh... The neutral grays that I've been using on the floors would be a good start, I think. And then, um, what could we do? What could we do? What could we do? We could do like orange stripes on the floor would be kind of cool, like red and orange stripes maybe. Like we've done this kind of masking to do paint on the floor, which is a great way to bring color in. Since we haven't used like a red, um, We've got enough bluish purple on her that I don't want to go into blues if we can avoid it. More green wouldn't be bad if we chose the right green. So like a really pale green maybe. You know what we'll do is we'll do the gray. And if you notice on these, the, the steel kind of gray that I've done on the floor, I kind of tinted blue. I don't know if you can really see that, but it has like a blue gray to it even out here, even before we get to the blue light. I think with her, what we'll do is do that same gray workup, but tint it with a little bit of green. Yeah, that's what we'll do. I like it. So first we gotta prime the damn thing. Start to finish, we're gonna airbrush a base. Here we go. I say here we go, is the compressor on? I feel like the compressor is on. Good God, man. Why is my airbrush so dirty? Seriously, I just gave this priming airbrush a top to bottom cleaning and it's already like <laughs> impossible. Yeah, it's all freaking gummed up right there. Boo hiss. Let me clean this needle off real quick. I hate this Patriot 105 for this. I'm not a big fan of top trigger airbrushes. They cause so many problems if you don't clean the seals in them all the time. That's why I like my pistol grips. I don't have to do this stuff. I don't have to clean my other brush. Not true. I'm a liar. Don't listen to me. You have to clean every airbrush. So I don't have to clean it like this. 
there's a weak point in these top trigger airbrushes where air and paint can mix in the back where the behind the uh, pot. It'll backflow if you do like uh, like you'll see me put my finger on the tip of the airbrush to backflow paint and water up into the cup to kind of mix and clean and all sorts of stuff. That's a bad habit to get into on a top trigger airbrush. On a uh, not so much on a uh, pistol grip. Oh, missed the trigger. There we go. Still nothing? What the? What the? What the? What the? And hold, please. I figure out what the hell's going on here. Get my spare needle out. I only use this brush for priming, so if I don't do a good job of prepping it before I set it aside, then I run this risk of every time I come after it, it'll be shot. I feel like the last time I used it, I might not have done a good job of cleaning it. Oh, that's her. Holy hell. I've got two kinds of wet in my pants. <laughs> Kenny, what's going on? Well, this is not good. What is happening, everybody? Coming over from Kenny's. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Sneaking in to do some Saturday streaming. Painting. Sitting here doing some painting and figured, well, well let's just paint with these fools. Well, with our friends. Huzzah. Make it happen. Just throw back my legs and pollute my britches with delight. Entire Mac, what's going on? Duh, entire Mac? Wasn't it different before? <laughs> What's going on? Eleven well, freaking huzzah, months. Huzzah. I'll just throw back my legs and pollute my I feel like with I feel like your name was different before. You change your name. Blessed Horizon Twitch Prime. Holy hell! Thank you much. What is going on, everybody? Hope the weekend and Saturday is treating you well. Yeah, you can. See, I don't know if you guys can see, but the inside of my nozzle guard is a disaster. Another reason why I don't like these badger airbrushes. They build up paint in areas that other brushes do not. And people just yell at me. They're like, well, if you took care of it, right? I'm like, That's true. That is true. I do take responsibility for not cleaning my airbrush properly because I don't like... <laughs> the amount of maintenance these things take. There we go. That should do it. Hey, somebody likes ah, us. Rap. Voodoo Von Acid Bath. What a great name. What's going on? Welcome to Saturday. My airbrush is torturing me. I just want to prime some stuff. Like, this should be really simple. This should be... God bless Badger. Freaking neat. They make everything hard, dude. You're going to hear me start cursing here in a second. Like, this is nonsense. Like, what is this thing, this bulb on the end of the needle? It makes it impossible, because normally you can put the needle in here, and then you can put the uh, the capture screw over the needle. But no. Let's make it something new. And... There we go. There we go. We're good to go now. All right, priming. Most of you know, if you haven't seen me, I only use Steinal Res, Badger Steinal Res Primer. Where I don't like their airbrushes, I really like their primer. It's just a rebranded uh, 
I forget what this ultra primer ultra prime i forget who makes this who the original manufacturer is of this stuff but it's really the best primer you can use to an airbrush the vallejo stuff is not bad well, huzzah, the badger huzzah. stuff blows it away i'll just throw back my legs and pollute my britches with delight jay heaver what's going on 17 freaking months 17 freaking months yeah lately i beat the crap out of this one it's my bastard stepchild airbrush i take very good care of all the brushes i actually use all the time this one not so much oh i mean i use this one all the time that's a lie right because i use this one all the time but it's you know it's relegated to just hey let's just prime with this one so it uh it is the red-headed stepchild no offense to all you redheads soulless bastages out there Just a real quick prime coat. Done those. I think that's all I got to prime, right? Always look around, find out what else I might want to prime. I don't think I have anything else I need to prime today. So that gets cleaned. Bill Neary, what's going on, man? Like I said, I hope everybody's having a wonderful start to your weekend. Just doing some random paint streaming. I was going to be painting anyway. Better to paint with my friends. Doing random stuff. I don't guarantee what I'm going to be painting today. Right now it's bases for infinity things. If I get sick of infinity, we'll paint something else. No plan. No plan. Don't even know how long we're streaming. Till Jen comes in and says she's hungry. That's usually the way that works. <laughs> She'd be like, so are you planning on eating today? And that might be, unless we, ooh, we could order pizza and we could just stream all day. That sounds like a plan. Maybe I can convince her to order pizza. Or go get pizza at Mod Pizza. Oh my gosh. See, that's where we need to invent, like, at least smell vision Right? Like, I feel like smell or, you know, taste-o-vision, I don't know. These are both really good, bad ideas, right? But I feel like smell-o-vision would be a good one, as long as I could be trusted to not, you know, like, have gas and be like, hey, guys, check this out, you know? But I feel like if I got Mod Pizza, it would be both a good and bad thing for you guys. It's so good. The taste-o-vision thing is a little scary to me, right? You just plug your brain into your monitor and be like, here, taste what I'm tasting. Try this sour milk. I feel like this would get out of hand, but I think we need to invent this. Somebody invent this real quick, and I'll I'll split the profits with you half and half. It'll be like that movie The Jerk with Steve Martin, where he makes the glasses with the pull tab on them, and everybody he goes he gets rich because everybody loves the idea, and then he gets sued and gets broke because everybody went cross-sighted from using the pull tab. I feel like that's what our smell and taste division would be like. Everybody would love it. We'd be bajillionaires. We could frolic in all of our money for about a week. And then we get sued, right? I feel like that's how that that story. I've already know. I already know the ending of the story. But it'd be fun while we do it. So somebody make that real quick. Absinthe, what's going on, girl? The entire Mac to drink is shenanigans, which I never. Yeah, it's a duh entire Mac. Why isn't it just the entire Mac? Make your mind up. <laughs> Zolti, what's going on? Genuine, what's going on? Holy hell! What's happening, man? How's your... Is this still late Saturday for you, or is it early Sunday already? I feel like it's early Sunday already, huh? Murphy Bob, you can't get tired of infinity, so I'll be in that chair forever. Ugh, I'm standing up. I stand up when I paint. Most of the time. My chair's over here loaded up with these things. What are these things called? Terror Geists? There's three Terror Geists in my chair right now. This is, this is what's in my chair. Three Terror Geists. And a sprue of something else. I don't know what those things are. Sprue of more ghasts, more more something. Bar ghasts, bar, some other death age of Sigmar thing. I can't sit in my chair is the end of that story. <laughs> I can't use my chair. 5.50 a.m. on Sunday morning. Why are you awake? Question mark. <laughs> Smell-o-vision would be an epic fail. 
during the introduction of Mongo and Blazing Saddles. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> We'd have to have like, I mean, like, yeah, it kind of would be great. It'd be the best worst thing ever, I feel like. smell vision Happy you won the $20. You won a $20 coupon? What? Jen hasn't told me who the winners were. So I don't know. I'm in the dark. Congrats. Congratulations. Jen posted all that. Jen's the promo queen. She's doing all that stuff, and she doesn't tell me anything. She doesn't like to deal with me. Always up this time at 5.50 a.m. What? What? Ugh. Chain rasps or glaive stalkers? Or, no, they're, they're, all of this stuff is uh, flesh eater courts, not night haunts. That's why you issue smell advisories. Yeah, there has to be a smell advisory. So now it's like it's TV ma and uh, and and TV. Well, we'd have to come up with a whole new lettering scheme for what bad smell vision would be. Right. This show includes lewd farting. Beware. Unplug your smell vision. Unless you're into that thing. I mean, I'm not I'm not judging. If you dig rancid farts, then. But I can just see like a whole line of shows growing out of our invention of smell vision right? Of course, the problem with smell vision is that it takes a little black box that plugs into your television through the, like the HDMI port or something like that. And then it has a long cord with a long needle that you got to shove in your ear or something, right? Or like your temple, or we have to get everybody to have a port on their head and you shove the needle in. And then, and then uh, there's that little stutter where, uh, where you tune into your TV and then the smells and the taste of television come in. I mean, you do that, right? Like, you get the port, right? Right? I'm not getting the port. I'm old. It would probably kill me. But you young kids should get the port. <laughs> and then I'll make all the programming. <laughs> World's worst jobs fail. <laughs> Hell's Kitchen when oh my god can you imagine like the Food Network would be our biggest sponsor right I feel like that's it and like National Geographic dude I would literally I would get the port I would shove the thing in you know and and then like watch like like the sound of music where she's in the fields on the mountains can you imagine what that would smell like that'd be awesome not not her, not Judy Garland or whatever, but I mean the, the fields and the flowers and the and the like the like the mount the travel show and like you get what I'm saying. They just have a box with smells that plugs into the TV. You just fill it up with the oils. TV stank, ebb and flow exactly. <laughs> Hints of sulfur, exactly. It's TV stank. This show is rated stank. Yeah, because like there was a guy. There was a guy, like one of my offices, I had an office down in Dallas, Texas, and the guy next to me was a criminal psychologist, I want to say, criminal psychiatrist. He was the guy that, like, when somebody said that they were insane during a, a plea, then they'd send them to him, and he'd go through all the rigmarole of what is really wrong with them, and then he'd counsel them and all that stuff. He was, like, in the office right next to us. And he had a deal in there that was a big spinning, like, centrifuge thing that had all these oils in it. And you could type in, uh, like, in the program on the computer, and this is back in, like, the mid-90s. You could type in, like, chocolate chip cookies, and the thing would spin up, right, and would heat some of the oils, and you'd get chocolate chip. It's, it's close approximation to chocolate chip cookies as a smell. And he'd use that to do, like, reversion therapy, or I think he called it, where they would, they would do smells from your childhood, kind of almost a hypnotic thing, you know? So I grew up in a trash can, and here's the smells of garbage. And it would make me remember how, you know, I was, why I'm afraid of bats. I mean, wait, wait, what? My, my parents got killed in an alleyway, and I lived in... Wait, what? Matt Aarons, what's going on? Forensic psychologist. Oh, is that it? I don't know. Whatever. Criminal pathol... I don't know. He's a dude... And I remember whenever I would work late, I was always worried because he had a lot of those people show up late that were like, you know, show up with police escort. Some murderer would show up like like legit. This is no joke. Like in a, just an office building. We had an office next to him and they'd be screaming over there and pounding on walls. And I'd be like, oh, my God, I, I wanted to like go over and make sure he, he was all right. But then I didn't want to go over there at all. 
Like I was like, yeah, you're either all right or you're not, bro. I'm out. <laughs> Just not real sure what was going on. Dirty jobs and hoarders. And I feel like any of the cop shows, you probably don't want smell vision <laughs> PSA, don't smell vision your porn. <laughs> you know the porn industry would be the first industry to adopt it. They're the first industry to adopt everything. They're the first industry to have like HD movies. Porn is always the early technology adopter. So porno would have smell vision first. And that would be all the fetish people that get off on the weirdest stuff. That would be disgusting. Blech. Blech. All right. Uh, press. Uh, this is a cork. That's poster tack. There you go. There's my mini holder. Uh, what colors do we want? I feel like, I feel like, I feel like black gray first is always a good start. So we're going to go with black gray. I am going to get out the model air black gray for this. We're just going to go model air black gray. I feel like, I feel, okay, this one works. I was about to say, I feel like my airbrush set has conspired against me today. Like I was just airbrushing yesterday. So you guys can't be that mad. There's not like paint left in the, in the well, right? Just the, the wonderful Arizona air and water. Makes everything that much better. Yeah, this is need, needs to get needs to get cleaned. Clean off my nozzle guard real quick. I keep a spare airbrush needle, one that was just bent a long time ago. Just keep the needle around so that you can use it to clean off any hard scaling or paint that might get where you don't want. I feel like that's pretty clean, though. Use my eyes. Where are my eyes? Bingo. There we go. See, I clean my brushes really well, but there's always like that, like literally in Arizona, if there's one drop of water on like the tip of the needle, it is, we have such hard, crappy water in Arizona that it will literally scale up and just leaving it for 24 hours and you just have to do a really quick scrub of the the nozzle tip there remind me what the african skin tone workup is sure smell vision it's called the nauseous the nauseous the nauseous nauseous rift it has to be n-o-z nauseous rift we have a patentable thing somebody go uh issue a trademark real quick for this Nauseous rift. I'm in. I'm in. I'll give you 10 bucks to back it. There we go. It's kickstart smell vision Make it happen. I'm putting you guys in charge. I own the rights. I'll split it with you. I'll give you guys collectively 3.5%. And uh, we'll make this... Uh, we'll be heroes. Until we're not. Until they sue us for whatever reason. For the port that has to go in your head. For the smell vision to work right. And once everybody finds out that the port is really bad for you, right? That it, it turns out, right? Just turns out randomly that uh, cutting a hole in your skull and inserting a needle so that you can smell what's on TV is not healthy. Ah, uh, who knew, right? I mean, I feel like the secondary business that we could do and make money on the smell vision thing is hats. Hats that have a built-in port plug on them, right? to seal against the rain. Because I don't know where your olfactory sensory stuff in your brain is, but I'm going to assume that it faces like towards the sky, that we would have to drill a hole. We would do it for marketing reasons, 
even though you could do it like at the base of the skull and put the port right behind the ear where it was protected from weather, we will market it as if it has to be like right on top, right? So that we can sell hats that have the plug in it. So you have to wear the hat to plug the port, right? Or we could, for, for, for people that wanted it, we could make a plug port that had like a flower on it that looks like a barrette or something, or like a My Little Pony. You see where I'm going? I think there's actually more money to be made long-term on the fashion of port plugs. That's just me, but I, that's where I'm going with it. So, are you with me? Can we can we get an amen and a hell yeah and all that good stuff? How did I paint these? I feel like it's darker in here, brighter towards the outside. See what you tune in for on Saturdays? I promise nothing on Saturdays. Saturdays is a no-fly zone kind of a stream. It's like, oh, this is what Fuse is like when nobody's watching him. When he's in his room alone and Jen has better things to do. This is the kind of shit he comes up with. smell vision and port plugs and marketing ideas that would get me thrown in federal pens in most countries. I feel like it's fair, fair to say. Been doing these to where it's darker right along this line in the floor so i'm just going to kind of haze the black gray and then put more out towards the outside edge you see there more towards the outside edge darker as i get in towards the uh the actual line and then i did this whole area first but now that it starts setting up and dries i'm gonna go in and there's this crack so i'm gonna go in and kind of work a, a little bit more of the black gray to brighten it up on this side getting darker as I run along the edge of that crack and then down towards the line in the floor as well All right, like so Hang on this one and then this little bitty spot up here is worry more when we start doing the highlights but started in a little bit like that Like so, just to get some nice setup for how our brighter colors are going to go in. You want to push the darkness pretty far back towards the line because you don't want it to be super dark. So play with that, but you don't want to you don't want to brighten up the area right next to that. Or at least I don't because of the way that we've been doing these. Right, that's kind of the the idea that we've been going with is that it's darker right there so that that OSL really stands out when we do the little lights on the floor. That kind of stuffs. All right, cool, nice. Uh, don't need that anymore. My Lord Megatron, who are you talking to? Old oh, man, what? I'm like 28 years old. I'm just prematurely gray. And if anybody buys that, like I said, I've got some investment opportunity with smell vision for you. <laughs> Limited productivity, what's going on? The company you used to work for sold scents branding for businesses. There was a product that had coffee scents for cafe settings and the like. I saw a Vice documentary that showed how an alternate battlefield realism smell canisters, oily machinery, burnt hair, and corpses. For like when you're playing a video game, you just set that next to you. It's like those base things, the the base deals, that the rumble seat things, they call them. Rumble seat, rumblers. You put a, a uh, driver, like basically a, a subwoofer driver on the bottom of your seat it's without the cone so it's a speaker without the cone part and uh put it on your seat and it moves the seat when the bass hits tried those in theaters and people got sick because the low frequency was causing people's guts to rumble um yeah so do like that but you could have you could have smells see i'm telling you man this is a thing i'm sure there's already people that have like patents on this and i'm a little late to the party but I think my idea of the port plug hats and the and the the My Little Pony barrette thing that goes in the hole is a great idea, right? Even if it goes behind the ear for the port, I feel like we could make like little tentacle things that came down and like hung, you know, like the old '80s heavy metal feather earrings. We could make like tentacles that went in the port and kind of came down here, so you could play with your tentacle all day, that kind of thing. 
I think we have a, a thing going. Shh, don't tell anybody though. This is our idea. My my idea. I'll give you three and a and three point two eight percent of the idea because you were here. <laughs> fake news in my Lord Megatron. Definitely fake news. I am not thirty whatever twenty eight years old that I said I was. I'm actually only twenty two. I'm living my life backwards. Flarian, what's going on? Welcome. Lately, it would be in the middle of the forehead. If you remember biology, right? That's that's where the that's where the lobotomy place is. <laughs> that's where the lobotomy place is. RB, what's going on? Handbags and shoes. Yeah, marketed right after portplugs.com. <laughs> Smell a port. Nas, what do we call it? The 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 Nas Nasports.com. No, because then it sounds like the port goes in the nose, and we're not trying to make it like we want it marketable, right? So it's going to be like pleasure port, or no, that sounds tough. That's, that's another business idea we could do. <laughs> oh boy, we're going to be rich or in jail, one of the two. Just follow me, folks. Follow me. I got this. I got this. We can make this happen. <laughs> Play hashtag pleasureports.com. <laughs> Ooh, boy. Where's a good gray-green? I feel like that cement gray would be kind of cool. Maybe. Is it? Yeah, cement gray. I feel like cement gray would be a cool color. I feel like it's too bright of a move from where we're at. So Maybe I should have mixed cement gray in with the gray that I just cleaned out of the pot. Right? I feel like that would have been a fairly smart thing to do. I am not a smart man. How about field gray? Field field gray? We're going to do that. Field gray and then cement gray. We're, you know, nothing around here is planned. So if you came here expecting a nice, concise plan and, and method of painting, go make me smell a vision. John Patrick, you for one welcome the impending cyberpunk future. <laughs> Accept your fate. This is how the Adeptus Mechanicus started. I got it figured out, man. Replace the flesh is weak. Make ports and My Little Pony plugs. Wait a minute. What are we talking about? I feel like this is uh, going in the wrong direction. So for my last day on Twitch, I'd like to invite you to... <laughs> for our last Twitch show before the banning, hashtag the banning of 2018... The great banning has occurred. Slow fuse. No longer welcome. Two drops. Dos Drapos of Field Gray, which is a color I've never used because it's way too clean to have ever been used before. Go figure. So two minuscule drops and a ton of flow improver. That looks pretty light, too, doesn't it? Well, we didn't get it thin enough. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. It's a light color, but it'll work. Trust me. It's, I, I'm a professional. All right. Here we go. Everybody close your eyes, because if I mess up, I don't want you to know I did it. I'm just going to start feathering this field gray color in over our dark gray real quick. Again, always trying to find that nice hybrid spot between paint and no paint. That's giving us the color that I'm looking for, kind of a grayish green. It's going over that black gray really nice. So even though the color's bright, because I can control the amount of paint that's coming out by riding that line on the trigger very nicely, then I don't wind up oversaturating our gray and we just start getting that kind of cement gray green going on that I want. And then I can kind of build up a little bit in the middle there, middle top. Slide around here and I'll out here towards this edge. I want it to be brighter. So again, I'm painting at a fairly steep angle or I guess shallow angle is really what it is. I'm painting like this with regards to the base so that I'm really just hitting the base with overspray. I'm not doing this. I'm not pointing at this area, I'm pointing past it so that all my overspray I can bring in as I need to gradually. 
Same thing over here. So you'll notice I'm painting my finger a lot here. Like so. go be likey likey setting up pretty good let's get a little bit more of this edge over here like so i like it leaving a little bit of darkness along all these cracks where we can so it gives us that depth and the brokenness and all that bingo uh i'm washing it out again <laughs> be like this will be one where I'm like, hey, we should have mixed it with that paint that we had in the thing last time before we cleaned it. But I'm not a smart man. That's like my standard answer to Jen when she goes, why didn't you do this thing? And I'm like, well, I'm not a smart man. That's my get out of jail free card thing. I'm old. That's the new one. Hey, I'm old. Leave me alone. I'm 28 years old. I can't be expected to do everything. All right. Now we're going to go to the cement gray. Just a lighter green. I think this military-ish kind of green is going to be good. Just because it's not a color I've used on any of the other ones. It's not quite as bright, but it'll allow us to set up a really cool colored stripe on the floor, I think. Which would be kind of neat. Kind of nifty. I got an idea. We're going to do a wide reddish orange stripe on the. But I feel like. I feel like. Not the way the paint's supposed to be. It's not the way the paint is supposed to be. So that's a thing. We'll do a, a reddish orange stripe and we'll do some lettering, like some block lettering in the stripe, like a big O1. Probably only really need like one drop, but I'm gonna put two. Any idea why your Harlequin develops small bumps on some bits? Uh, poison Ivy? Rash? Hanging out with the wrong crowd? <laughs> what do you mean by small bumps? Did you airbrush it all lately? Did you use an airbrush? Did you prime with rattle can? Could there have been some texture from the priming? Um, could there be, are you using different types of paint? Uh, small bumps can be made if you use like an enamel or an oil and go back over that with an acrylic before the enamel of the oil has had time to cure, the air bubbles that it forms as it cures through an, a layer of paint that's dried on top of it can cause problems. Um, those are just a few right off the top of my head. Airbrush with primer, hand painted everything with Citadel. Mm, paint boogers. <laughs> um, I feel like, and it wasn't there that you noticed with your primer, huh? If you airbrushed it. Yeah, those would be my, my guesses there, unless maybe there's, um, it can happen sometimes if you use, um, like airbrush thinner will cause the paint to act really funny if you don't get all the airbrush thinner, or the airbrush cleaner out, sorry, not thinner, cleaner. Get in tight so I can highlight just that little wedge pie wedge broken piece there the airbrush cleaner will cause all sorts of problems with paints I, I don't know that i've ever seen it like cause bubbles or bumps but that doesn't mean it's not possible now i'm going to start kind of highlighting for uh like a little bit of a metallic floor sheen i don't i guess this one could be more concrete doesn't have to be metallic at all we'll go kind of in between it's sci-fi we can do what we want all right, so I'm going to catch, I'm going to use the overspray to edge this. So I'll be painting my finger. 
right? And then bringing it down to where just the overspray starts edge highlighting. See how that happened? Little edge highlight, all the paints on my finger. You just use the overspray cone to kind of edge highlight the thing that you're painting. Hey, somebody likes us. Hey, the real Fisher, what's going on? Thank you so much for the follow. I think it's Fisher. Does it get that right? Same thing over here. Just catch that edge. And then I just want to build up some brightness kind of right out here towards these high spots that I've been building up. Same thing right over here. And then play with it and feather it back in depending on how much and how far I want that bright area to intrude on my darkness. That way we get kind of a cool splotchy natural kind of look, but you can see I've done these triangles out to each of these pie pieces, so to speak. Right. And then the grays and greens kind of come in darker in here. And then this OSL from this light will occur at some point. I'm pretty happy with this. I think it's a little dark in here. So I'm going to take this and I'm just going to kind of haze it over the top just to lighten up all of our darkness a bit, pull it together. I don't want to sink my shadows too far, but by just using this paint that I've got in the cup, even though it's my lightest color, just use it and feather it on there. Then we can retreat those shadows just a little bit so it doesn't look quite so blotchy. And I'm happy with that. I likey likey. Now I'm also going to take some of the paint right out of this cup. Well, huzzah, huzzah. Always hard for a lefty to do. Throw back my legs and pollute my britches with delight. Carter, what the hell? Good to see you, my friend. How are you doing? I'm going to set it over here, which is always a bad idea, because then I'll put my paintbrush in it and forget about it. But I want to make sure that I, at this stage in time, before we airbrush the next color, I go ahead and find some of this edge highlight and strengthen it. Even though this is ultra thin for the airbrush, I can just take it with the side of the brush. Go ahead and boost up that edge a little bit where I caught it with the overspray. So. All right. And then I think for the cement gray, I'm just going to add ivory directly to it for a highlight. I think. Does that seem like a good idea? We'd use that pale sand we just used. Nah, it's a little too yellow. I think we'll use ivory. Did I give ivory to Jen? Did Jen steal the ivory? Is, is Jen a thief? Jen's a thief. She's a thieving thief that thieves. If she were here right now, she'd beat my butt. Because as I'm looking at her desk, there's no ivory over there. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so the answer is not Jen's fault. It's my fault. Damn it. It's right here in front of me. Shh. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. I'll take a look at it in a second, Lee. Try to see if we can't figure it out. Is it is it to the point where it's it's adding texture that is completely visible? All right, so here I'm just going to use what we already have in the pot. And I'm going to put one, two drops of ivory in there to start, and we'll mix that up and see if that gets us lighter enough. The goal you can just visually see generally if you do this how much brighter we can get that paint. I feel like that's probably going to be good. That got a lot brighter than you can see the the residue of paint on the wall there. That's a lot brighter. Now we want to thin that down because I don't think, yeah, it's not going to be thin enough. I'm going to just do a quick squirt of water. 
in the cup with this paint that I already had in there. If the water thing will actually squirt would be good. Why are you not squirting water? Okay, we're not going to use water. I feel like I'm going to put the whole thing in there. Whenever I get to this much paint, um, after I've mixed this much into the, the pot, I typically would use like a 50-50 flow improver and water mix. The water didn't seem to want to come out of the squirter correctly and I'm always afraid I'm going to blast like four liters of water in there so we just use more flow improver which isn't a horrible thing it's just going to make it to where this dry time on this might be a little bit longer if we're not careful I think we're okay it'll work all right same thing now I'm just going to start Spraying less and less of this brightness in here, catching a little bit of that edge as we come around. All right, so I'm just brightening up that little edge of the triangle in there. I'm not bringing it too far in, right? Because I don't want to overtake any of our other colors, but I want to keep punching up the brightness in the, the wide spot of the triangle we formed. So I aim like right to the center of that, bring it down a little bit, and then flare it out towards the edges using that same overspray technique. Get in a little bit there on that little pie piece up there. And then this one's the biggest one. So we'll just kind of brighten that one up. So punch this up a little bit brighter right at the tip like this. And same here. Again, using the overspray as kind of an edge highlight. All right, so I can capture that edge. And you'll see I'm painting my finger most of the time. That's the key. Aim at something other than the base. Use that. And now what you see is we've got this comet tail that gives us kind of that ability to call it like a not polished metal. Right? But gives us a little bit of that glare in there. And I think that works a bit well. I don't know that I want to go too much brighter than this. We might punch just a little bit more in the dead center of these triangle areas. Felt like I was getting a little bit of tip clog. Like that that works that works very well clean this out um actually i'm gonna do the same thing i'm gonna grab a little bit of it and edge with it first before we clean it out even though it's super thin so it's not gonna give me the opacity i want probably we'll see question mark yeah it's super super thin just to give you an idea of what i'm airbrushing with thinness wise like if i take it over here over my black see how little bit of the color shows through right even though it's it's a really bright color that's how thin I'm running it through the airbrush, just to give you an example. We don't normally show you a good way to tell how thin I airbrush, but that gives you a good insight to it. And this will help me brighten some of these edges up without being overly opaque. And even though you might, like if you're going brighter than I am on this, you could do this edging and then you could hit it with your next level of airbrushing. Hey, somebody you don't, likes us. You don't have, oh, and son, what's going on? You don't have to wait until you're done airbrushing to go in and do a little bit of brush work. Sometimes it is beneficial to you to do both and intermix them because the brush work will set up a highlight underneath your next layer of airbrushing if you're doing it thin. Uh, of course, if you're airbrushing opaque, you're going to cover all this up. But if you're like me and most of your airbrushing is very, very thin, then you can get away with, you know, doing this little bit of edging here and uh, 
having it work perfectly for like the next color that you put over it because now the next color would be brighter around this edge where it fell where it hits this edge highlight if i were to spray a you know a uh, say a blue tone over this or something then these edges are going to remain very bright because i've amplified them with the brush work here so never think you got to do all your airbrushing before you do your brushing or anything like that you can play around with it And again, I don't want this to be too bright because I will be building up off of this, but this will be a good setup for us. Okay. Again, I'm just getting this paint right out of the, the paint cup on the airbrush. Now here, I am going, I'm not going to highlight this entire line on both sides of this trough. I only really want to focus on one, so I picked this side. On this one, I want to just come in very lightly and kind of highlight going in towards our little light box here to set up for our OSL. This. Same thing over here. A little bit here and then on the back side. Because we know we're going to do these as glowy lights in the floor, so this just kind of helps us set up for that. But uh, notice how I don't do this whole line on the top, just that spot right close to the box that helps us with the OSL. Stay with this. Now I'm just going to pick a side arbitrarily on this crack. Here I'm picking the longer continuous side to highlight. Because it gives me the most... Um, bang for the buck, so to speak. This one whole big long line to highlight is gonna give me more visibility on the base. So I'm just gonna choose it, bang. Now, once you've made a choice on like what side of a crack to do, choose a crack like weathering or whatever you've decided to do, make sure that you gain or, or highlight the same side or close to it on all your other cracks. So on this one, I'm also gonna highlight this left edge as well. Just keep that consistency as you go. When you can. Uh, uh, I guess I could start doing some of these little pock marks in the concrete as well. It's a little early to do that because we're going to put the stripe on the floor but not too bad. We might cover some of them up and have to redo them, but for those are the ones that stay to the outside. Now, again, this has got lots of like concrete porosity to it in the sculpt. So I'm not trying to get all of it. I just want to get a little bit. Vary it as you go. If you try to do all these little spots or if you dry brush it, you'll put too much texture on from what you just did with your airbrush. And I, I mean, it can be a cool looking effect, but I tend to think that the dry brushing messes up what I've already done spending time with on the airbrush. So just coming in and picking out, you know, random points on the base to grab some of that texture just by stippling it with the brush tends to work a lot better, in my opinion, as to how it looks at the end of the day. Notice how I'm even grabbing these highlights in the darkest spots up here. And because I've chosen to highlight this edge, we'll call it the bottom edge of this slot. Um, that's why I'm highlighting all of these from the bottom edge as well. Even those little things like that will help give you some coherency to your painting so that when you look at it, while it may not make sense, you've made these choices just for artistic license, so to speak. It's okay. Right? It just gives it a coherency that looks really good. And I mean, this is all super simple. I mean, we've done this super quick, but this is a really good looking base already. I'm going to grab a little, there's another little kind of secondary crack running along here. So I'm going to grab some of that spotty along its length. I'm not going to do the whole thing as a line. I'm just going to kind of grab pieces and bits as we go. And then get some of these areas that come off to the side of it. Bingo. 
right, and that's a pretty good look already. I mean, we could literally just do the OSL on this and have it be fine as like a concrete base because we're using these as lights. All right, if you haven't seen what the other ones that we're doing look like, they're kind of like this. Same thing, just different colors that we're doing on the bases. Chose to do this one in more of a greenish gray concrete than the other ones that we've done. So I'm digging it. That looks pretty good. She's a pretty nice. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and... I'm not going to do the rest. I was going to highlight some of the other edges, but I'm not. I, I would get carried away. I, I don't want to do the next stuff. It's it's adhering to my rule, my golden rule of don't finish any one part until you're ready for all the other parts to be finished. Uh, right now, we need to put like an orange stripe or something on here so we can do some lettering. just to, And just to, you know, so we can break it up and make it look cool like these other bases. Uh, this is the one for the corporate security unit that we just kind of finished up. All right, so she's going to be sitting on this base. So I figure she doesn't have any red. So we'll do kind of an orangish red on here. And we probably need to let that cure for a minute before hey, I put uh, masking us. tape on there. Ace of Spades, Rob, what is going on? Uh, Ort Pride was asking about African skin, so we'll do that here real quick. And then Laylee wants us to look over the picture real quick, so we'll do that. We'll let this thing cure before I put masking tape on it. I don't want to tear all that paint back off, so we'll let it cure. We paint real thin, so everything cures and dries pretty quick. I don't have a problem putting the masking tape on it here in just a second. All right, so let's take a look real quick. The per you like the purples on her? We painted her like Daphne from Scooby-Doo. That was you guys. During one of our streams, everybody was like, she looks kind of like Daphne. So we painted her like Daphne from Scooby-Doo. She's got the green tie and the, the purple and blue. Although I don't know that, yeah, I think Daphne, I don't remember if Daphne wore pantyhose or not, but we did the pantyhose on her to give it the sheer look on the legs. Turned out pretty fun. Turned out pretty fun. Corcanelis, uh, this is from Infinity. All of these guys are from Infinity. So we are painting up what is uh, the Operation Ice Storm box set for Infinity the game. And so they're all 28 millimeter cyber futuristic thingamajiggers. So we've got the, it comes with the Nomad faction, which is all these black and red and gray guys. And then the, the uh, Pano faction, which I've done in these blues. So you've got a lot of heavily armored dude it's kind of anime-esque if you think in terms of like apple seed ghost in the shell it has a lot of influence from that style of anime and you know i don't know if cyberpunk future style stuff to it it's a really good game uh, it's low miniature count you i mean i think the most miniatures you could have would be like 24 on your team or something like that so. all right so let's look at the magic card here. Um, for African skin tones, dark skin tones, uh, this is a really good workup. This is just from the old card, so I'll hold this here. You can, uh, if you want, I have a JPEG of this, so if you contact me on Facebook, I can get you the JPEG of it that shows everything from kind of alien dark, sickly skin, tan flesh, and pale flesh all on here. This is an old cheat sheet that I put together. All the colors on here are Vallejo only. Um, so you can switch in other colors that you have. They're in kind of the same range. Um, but for the African skin, starting out with a, a black brown um, is really good. So on here, I would change this. This is chocolate brown with black and gray added in for shade. But you can use just cam black brown, the German cam black brown 7822 in model color. We carry this on the store. You can use that as your first deep color because it has still a little bit of a reddish to it, so it feels alive rather than a wood brown that you would use that's just kind of a neutral brown. Um, or you can do the chocolate brown and add the black and gray as you need to desaturate it and act as your shader. Um, and then chocolate brown up from that, flat earth is a great color over the top of that. Uh, it has a, a really cool orangish kind of brown that it moves up to, right? So I really, really like it for skin. Uh, coming up out of the chocolate brown. And each of these stages, depending on if you're if you're working very thin, then you can just layer it. If you're uh, working thicker, then of course you would blend each of these stages. Um, and then over the top of the flat earth, I generally go in with flat flesh um, or any of the uh, lighter skin tones, say like, uh, da, 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 da. not quite barbarian flesh, more like the... Uh, 
the elven style flesh tone. So this is model air skin tone. Uh, the elf flesh from Army Painter would be good. I don't have it over here. It's probably over on Jen's bench. Uh, even things like, well, Corpse Pale is probably a little too pale. You want it to have a little depth to it, right? But any of those uh, kind of basic skin tones, things that don't go to super pale colors are great at this level uh, to start blending in with the flat earth, right? And then when you want to go back over it, of course, I have always, uh, you can mix mahogany in at each of these stages to get the kind of blood under the skin or do what I have shown you many times and just use something like wasteland soil over the top of it. Uh, wasteland soil glazed over the top of dark flesh has the same impact as it would on Caucasian flesh, any Asian olive skin tones, alien skin tones, anything like that. Taking the wasteland, it's, it's a color you need to have in your arsenal is wasteland soil. It's such a powerful uh, tool. Even if you never use it straight, uh, just being able to glaze in to get, you know, the fleshy kind of life onto a model is, is worth it, right? Because that's all I ever use it for. Right? But even on things like this uh, troll, where we've used the wasteland soil to give it that kind of pinkishness in the thin skin area of the uh, elbow and here at the palm. So it's not quite a pink, not quite a red, glazes over the green and the brown of the troll really nice and brings life to it so you feel like there's blood underneath the skin. Just works wonders. A little bit on the knee. Again, wasteland soil, just you can't go wrong. Buy it. We've got it at the store. I usually carry it by the dozens. It's, a, it's one of our colors. It's one of my mainstay colors. So this, mahogany, ivory, the gray workups that I do, those are the colors that we stock really deep on the store because they sell a ton. So grab some. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, or Blue, are there any VODs of me painting the nylons for the Infinity model? No, I don't think so. I think that I did the sheer on this off stream as a matter of fact i'm pretty sure i did and that as soon as i finished i had that moment of that momentary like lapse of reason when i was painting her and then i was like i should be streaming this so then i turned the stream on but i was already done so um this though there, there's multiple ways of doing it uh you can do sheer cloth depending on what your your goal is with it like i've done this that i wanted to feel more like it was like a like a I, I want to say fishnet, but without the fishnet texture, but that much darker feel where the flesh was just a hint, right, on her. I did it here. And so this method is paint the flesh first and then glaze black, in this case, glaze black or black brown over it so that you're covering up the flesh with the material. Uh, that's how I did this. So I painted her skin on the chest just like I did her face and then glazed the black over the top. Uh, that's one method to do it, but it gives you a very defined look. It makes it to where the cloth seems like it's um, heavier material. And the, the fact you can see through it is because it has holes in it, like microscopic holes like fishnet or some perforated material. That's the effect it's going to get. If you want something like this that is literally just a sheer cloth that it, it becomes see-through as it stretches like pantyhose, then I just blend these colors up from the base. So it's all painted like this from the start. So this would start off as a black base, then using the cam black brown, I think, on it. Again, as my base skin layer was cam black brown. So very much uh, the idea of it being like painting African skin tone again. As a matter of fact, if we pull this out, you'll see that it's almost exactly like painting dark skin tones, you know? The, that African style skin tone. The thing that makes it look like sheer cloth is that the rest of her skin is bright Caucasian, like pale or tanned Caucasian flesh. So now when you see this, it's like, oh, I get it. But if we just covered her like this, that could very easily be just dark skin legs, right? It's that that pulls it home to being pantyhose. Well, that and the fact that we painted a line down the back of the, the leg on each of her legs, right? Gives it kind of a feel of it. Make sense? But if you just attack it like you're painting darker flesh tones, then, you know, you can make this happen uh, and then just your flesh on its own kind of sells it. Now, the thing is, is you're probably going to want to, uh, like, impact the shadows a little bit more than if you were just painting regular flesh. So, like, the inner thigh, the knee down is a lot darker than if I were just painting dark skin tones. There's, like, almost no highlight coming down here. Where if it was skin, I would probably put a little bit more highlight. And, of course, I would then put uh, the reds, a little bit of fleshy colors around the knee, which you won't do 
here, right? I, I'll, I'll assume that a lot of the like things that make skin look alive are hidden by the actual sheer cloth, right? So you don't have to do as much work. But like I said, good point of thinking is that you're just painting dark skin and then you're, you're imposing a little more darkness into the shadows to give that kind of, uh, that there is a layer of fabric there rather than just all the top dermal layers. Just a good way to think about it. You've been looking forward to getting off the GW paint train and do some infinity? Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, let us, uh, we have a community gallery if you type exclamation point WIP in chat. Uh, I don't look at it all the time. Today I'll look at it. Lately wants us to look at something, so I'll take a look. But on Wednesdays, uh, the whole show is dedicated for three hours at taking a look at the community work that you guys are doing and answering questions. So if you have, if you like, say you try doing pantyhose or sheer cloth, uh, catch or not, thank you so much for the follow. Um, you know, tune in on a Wednesday and you can post your picks up and ask me questions. Say, hey, I was trying to follow along with what you were saying. I'm, you know, I'm having trouble with X, Y, Z. And I can take a look at the picture that you do. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, late, no problem. Not a problem. So Orc, I did that. Lily, we'll take a look at hers. Catch or not from Turkey. Holy hell. Welcome. Good to have you. My name is Jason. I'm Slow Fuse. We're painting. Uh, I'm working on various miniatures right now. We're, we're working on... Uh, getting her done. And right now we're working on a base. So we're painting this base up to match kind of this style, but with different colors for the rest of our, our dudes and dudettes for infinity. So it's a commission that I'm, I'm winding down on and I'm way behind on. I need to get them out the door. Uh, but let me take a real quick look over. Let me refresh this. Hey, somebody likes us. Tack, what's going on? Thank you so much. Welcome everybody. If you're new here, hope you're enjoying it. If you like what you see, please do give us a follow. Uh, all right. So Lily's picture. Let's bring over the uh, whip window real quick, like. Uh, and let me zoom in so I can see, because she's saying she's finding some texture show up on her model that she's not enjoying, some bumps, as she put it, which I said was probably a rash. Have it looked at. See a doctor. Now, did you say it's mostly in the green? Oh yeah. Oh wow. Really? This? And these? Yeah, that's visible. That looks like, you know, because it looks like a not clean model, right? It looks like the sculpt had something in it, but because it's GW, you know that the plastic probably didn't have that hey, in there, right? Somebody likes us. Corkadillos, thank you so much. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you know this isn't part of the plastic, right? I can't imagine the, the plastic having That would be a big bummer from GW because most of their stuff is not like that. But I mean, you see it here. Is it anywhere else or is it mostly like a little bit on this on that could be the edge like sprue connect since it's on the edge. This bother is bothersome because that's not where like it's sprue points. Um, hmm. What I would do if this were my model and in my hands right now is I would get either a magnifying glass or, you know, my eyes, my glasses on and I would take an airbrush needle and I would see if they pop. Right. I would poke at it with something very sharp, an airbrush needle or something. Just take it and see if they actually pop and deflate. Because what happens, right, with, um, let's see if we can get a magic card that isn't loaded up with a bunch of stuff already. I'm running out of magic cards. It's not like they sell them for like a dollar for a million of them, Fuse. Okay, so what happens and what causes this with paint a lot is a simple process but it's very annoying for us when we're painting, okay? So if you've got the, the surface of the model, right? And you put one layer of paint on here, right? So we'll, we'll say that this is the, the model itself, right? So we put this first layer of paint on, okay? If this layer of paint with acrylics, we usually don't have to worry about this because it's just water and polymer, uh, right? And so it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have anything to off gas except for the water evaporating. Okay, so when the water evaporates, which happens based on your humidity, can happen very quick or it can be, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, whatever. It's generally fairly fast with acrylics. So that's why we love them. Uh, they're, they're very ADD focused. You can paint a whole model in a day because you're not having to set it aside and let the oils cure or let the enamels cure or whatever. You can just keep painting like we do. 
right? But like I said, if when you airbrush this, there was any airbrush cleaner left in your airbrush, and so the layer of primer, which would be this first layer, right, would be our prime layer. If the paint had any airbrush cleaner mixed in with it, you might not notice it when you paint it on, but that airbrush cleaner does not evaporate at the same rate that water does. It evaporates much slower in most cases. Um, as long as, if it's an alcohol-based cleaner, then it evaporates faster than water, but most times they're not when you're using it for airbrush. Like the Iwata is not an alcohol-based cleaner, and it is actually it, it, like a drying retarder in it, right? So it takes a lot longer to cure. So if you put that prime coat down, but then you go back over that with another coat of paint, right? What winds up happening is that not all the gas it has, has uh, gone away out of this. And so this gas is trying to push up now you have a layer of dried plastic basically with your first color on there and you still have gas trying to push its way up from the prime layer and everywhere where it tries to push up can form little bubbles, right? If it's almost cured, then that's all it'll do is it'll form these little bumps in your paint, right? If it has not cured hardly at all, then it will burst these and you'll get cracks, right? Along the surface, you'll see the paint crack and, and do that crackle. That's how crackle base works, right? Is it's off gassing and breaks out the paint and all that. So you can get it to crack and burst and have holes in the paint. Okay. So that could be happening and it could be the chemical problem here of this off gassing, pushing your acrylic paint up. But that's why I would say, try to maybe pop it. And you run like two drops in your airbrush, but out of paint, out of habit. Yeah. So you need to basically, when you go through and clean your brush, flush it with water afterwards to get all of the cleaner out. You don't want the cleaner in the paint because depending on the humidity where you're at and depending on how, how, you know, how dry or wet it is, will determine how fast all that cures. If it doesn't cure and you're painting like we always do, just layer after layer after layer, one layer will trap all that gas and bubble up. And that could be what it is. And it could be that that's why it's only in particular spots where the paint was thicker. Um, you know, you never know. That's the issue that I think you're probably having just based on looking at it. Yeah, and you've got a lot of humidity in Louisiana. So, yep, you could be. That could be the whole issue right there is that it's too humid for it to cure properly. And so now you're green when it goes over and your green is pretty thick and dries. And now this is air trying to get out these little bumps. Because right? I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if you rubbed it, it pops and moves the paint around. And the bigger problem is that this paint is not going to be adhered to the model very well if that's the case. That's why I would say try to pop it with an airbrush and see if it is like a pimple. And if it pops and you can press it down with your thumb, uh, then you might want to try to do that. Poke them, press them down with your thumb, see if it stays. Then maybe try to stop where you're at and varnish the whole model to capture all that paint on it. You know, me personally, if I found that that was what was happening, I would give it a good rub with my thumb and see if all the paint came off. Because if it does, it means that none of that primer layer cured, none of that paint layer cured, and you're always going to run the risk, no matter what you do, of all that paint coming off. So before I put on too much work, as a matter of fact, you guys have seen that happen on the channel if you've been around for a long time. Like two years ago, we were painting the white cloak on, um, not Airbus, whatever the, the Emperor's Children first captain is. Um, and we were painting his cloak and that happened. And it would, the white, when we put down that first layer, white wouldn't stick and it kept sloughing off and cracking because it had airbrush cleaner in it. It happens to everyone, right? <laughs> if you're not careful, so. Yeah, unfortunately, it's like with that cloak, I just stripped it. I just stripped the cloak because I was painting it separately, so I got lucky there, but yeah, kind of sucks. It sucks when that happens. I hate it. All right, let's get back to this. Let's uh, let's lay down some masking tape here. I think I have my masking tape someplace around here. Yep. So we sell this flexible masking tape from Tamaya on our site, uh, and it is my go-to tape. It works wonders. Very low tack, repositionable. You can even reuse it if you want, right? And I'm just gonna want to. I'm gonna want to make it kind of a wide stripe on this one, I think. So I'm gonna come in like, gonna make this as straight as possible. But I want it to be kind of a wide. Do I? Yeah, I want it to be kind of wide. So I'm gonna do like that, I think. Oh, where are my scissors? Oh, they're there. Jen stole my scissors. Keep blaming Jen. Hashtag blame Jen. So 
Don't press it down too tight, but tight enough. And that's straight enough for government work. Looks good to me. Uh, 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 oh, you know what we'll do is we'll run it. Will we run it all the way to the edge? Question mark? Yeah, I feel like we're running all the way to the edge. It's going to do away with all the work we did on the gray end here, but I think that works. That works. I'm afraid if I bend down, my glass is going to fall off my head, so I'll just put them on. This. Usually fold it over a little bit on the edge just so that corner when I'm spraying doesn't allow paint to get up underneath the edges real bad. And we'll just do this whole center streak here with this stuff. That'd be all right. It'd be all right. I tell you, it's a good. I'm using the five mil right now. This tape comes on our Somebody store in like two, three, and twelve mil. Two, three, five, and twelve. I think I only have five mil in stock right now. It's been really hard to get. It comes direct from Japan, and it's a pain in the butt. They make uh, yellow masking tape and all sorts of stuff. So I just mask it off a little bit so we don't get any overspray around. Thank you for that follow. Welcome. Is the BAB going to be good for laying down base coats on vehicles like the car drawn, ironclad, and orc trucks? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the BAB is a great brush for that. It's the the big ass brush, right? So yeah, it's a great brush. Uh, I love it. It's uh, it's a little long. The new ones that we're gonna do, we're gonna reduce this by about half. We're gonna have it be ten millimeters because it, it's intended to be more of a dry brush, right? So the new one is gonna get lower. And then we'll have some of these in stock to sell to people that, that use it a lot. And then we'll see what everybody likes. And we might come out with a, a bigger, longer one again, too. We'll see. But it's great for big stuff, for show. Sure. Okay, so when we're doing reds and oranges and stuff, I start with mahogany or burnt umber. I'm going to do mahogany here. So we will grab model air mahogany. It's a good reddish brown. That'll go very well over this, very thin. So, oh God, see, I told you. Remember, I said I always hate painting right out of the cup because I forget to clean the cup. And what did I do? This has been sitting over there the whole time I've been yapping. The good thing about painting super thin is that your paint doesn't ever turn into like, well, it's not that it doesn't ever. It's that because we paint so thin, our paint in the airbrush stays pliable for a very long time. So even though it's been sitting over there for a minute, it should wipe right out. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, it just wipes right out, so... We got lucky. But normally what would happen there is Jason goes and has dinner and then goofs around on the computer and does some work and goes to sleep and wakes up the next day. And if I paint the next day and I need my airbrush, I pick up my airbrush and I look over at it and I go, mother, mother, and I curse very loudly and very, uh, <clears throat> very colorful manner. And uh, ask myself why I always do that. Because I always do that. Literally happens all the time. My poor airbrushes. Is, is, I feel like I take really good care of them. I feel like that's also a lie. <laughs> so I feel like I might be a lying liar who lies. I'm not ready to admit that live, although I think I just did. All right, I feel like we're good. We good. Try to get most of this water out of here. Mahogany, back to it. Big Bob, what's happening, man? Amiibo, hey, what's going on? Somebody likes us. Awesome, thank you. Amiibo, thank you so much for the follow. Glad you're digging them. We are just about to the point where I'm ready to say that we've got all of the brush sizes taken care of. We're locking the lines down. We're making some minute changes to some of the stuff like the utilities, changing the handle length on the utilities to be a little bit shorter to match the rest of the line. Um, you know, just really simple changes. And I think we're good. We're going to have like 24 different brushes, I think, at the end of the day. Uh, we just came out with the larger debt cords, the size 2, 3, and 4 in the debt cords, which I'm loving. That's what I've been painting with today. Um, and then from there... Uh, the redo on the utility brushes adds a number six round. We're getting rid of the workhorse round, what we call the workhorse round in that set we're getting rid of. Um, 
just causes too much problems trying to do that funky cut on those. I'll keep working to see if we can make it happen better implementation in the future. But for now, we're getting rid of that. We're just replacing it with a number six uh, base wash brush. Um, like I said, we're shortening the bristles on the BAB a little bit, but it's still there. And then the we're adding a brush. Uh, we've got the the standard angle dry brush that everybody loves. That's literally one of our largest sellers is the angle dry brush in that set. Um, and then we're adding a, uh, a a small dry brush, an eighth inch dry brush as well for like real tight spots or shading and detail work that you want to do. So that'll be the sixth brush in the set. So when you see the new utilities, instead of five brushes, it's going to have six, which should be cool. All right, so now we've got really, really thin mahogany. And so what I want to do here is follow the same structure that I set up with the concrete color here. I want to make sure it's brighter towards the upper part and darker towards this where our line is ultimately. So I'm just going to kind of feather in my mahogany very lightly across this gray that we've got. Right, Not pushing much into the shadow, so not much down along this bottom side. Keep most of it up towards the top. So you'll see me painting the masking tape more than anything here. And you'll notice how the highlighting, remember how I told you with the highlighting that you can go ahead and brush the details in? Because notice how my details still show. They just start turning red. Now eventually I will overpower those highlights probably and they will go away, but for the time being, they're gonna show a little bit. We may get lucky and they may show through the whole situation, but. So that's looking pretty good. And pile a little bit more in up top. I mean, that almost, the, the concrete color almost added or acted like a perfect pre-highlight for that. So that's pretty good. We're still bright enough around the edges. We're going to lighten it up a little bit. That's pretty good. I like that. As a matter of fact, I think I might just add, no, yes, no, yes, no. I was thinking I might just add some color to the mahogany rather than dumping in another color. So let's see if I can maybe drop a drop or two of that out of the cup real quick. I don't need that much paint. And then we'll just add a color to this. I think I'm going to play around. Like I'm almost tempted to just add ivory straight to the mahogany. And see what we get because mahogany is not going to turn red as we add ivory to it it's going to give the browns and the oranges that are in the mahogany a little bit of a chance to uh to show themselves so let's try that at least in the cup real quick it may not work the way we want it to but let's give it a shot because i'm looking for something that isn't the same red that we painted on the nomads right so i'm just going to do a drop of mahogany or a drop of ivory right into our mahogany there and again we can mix it right in the pot and see what happens to that color. And I think that's gonna be great, right? It gives us this weird kind of pinkish, reddish, brownish color in there. It's almost like a terracotta, like a light terracotta. For you guys, it probably just looks pink, but here it's like a very light, like terracotta tile. I think we're gonna do that. I'm gonna thin that out some more with some flow improver just because I added the model color ivory. So it's a very thick pigmented color and I don't want this to be super opaque as we apply it. I want it to stay really, really thin so I can layer it up as needed. I'm gonna add a bunch more of the flow improver in there. That might've been too much flow improver, but we'll go with it anyway. We'll make it work. We have the tools, we're professionals. At least you guys are, I don't know about me. I, I try to pretend like I am. Oh yeah, I think that's gonna be perfect. It's super, super thin, so I'm gonna have to be careful so it doesn't spider out, but I'm really liking this color, I think. So again, let's move our duders out of the way. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and try to get lighter here at the corner real quick. Feather that back. Notice I'm shaking the tip of the brush just to make sure I don't build up too much paint in any one location. I start getting that lighter tone on tone color built up there. Switch over here where it's already a little bit lighter. Right. Again, just kind of start building up color right through there. Working it back. Yeah, that's perfect. That's going to give us a really unique color on the floor. I think I'm going to dig it. OK, 
keep feathering it along the top edge there and over in this corner. So, uh, man, I don't know. I don't know if we need to go lighter than this or not. Maybe a little bit. actually pretty good with white letters right down the middle of that that might be perfect you never can tell when you mask it right you're like hmm what happens when i take it off <laughs> i'm almost tempted to just see i'm almost tempted to say hey i feel like we got the right color i'm going for it screw it i don't think i need more than that i think everything else we do is going to be brushwork on top of this See how low tack this tape is? I mean, remember, we just painted all this stuff on there. And I love this flexible Tamiya tape. It works like a champ. Bingo. Got a little bit where there's a divot in the sculpt, but we'll catch that with the edge. It'll be fine. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great because, see, it's not the same red that we use for our Nomads, but it gives us a bang of red on the concrete. It's actually very desaturated and faded, so I think that works really well. And we can play with a cool color for the light, maybe green. We've done blue. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll do green light on her, too, because we've done blue lights on these, right? We've done red lights on these. We'll do a green light on hers with the red stripe. Kind of pulls it all together, right? We've got, like, the gray steel um you know on the note on these guys that also has on some of them has the the hazard stripes on a couple of them with the red lights then we've got the green jade kind of floor stripes on these for the nomads with their red armor right so i feel like that's a good combo and then on the one for daphne right we do the red stripe with the gray concrete and the green light and she's got just that little stab of green on her tie. I think that's going to be perfect. I like it when a plan comes together. Enigma, what's happening? Lately, take it easy. Have a great day. Hope you get that fixed. Let us know how it goes. Warboy. Oh, I answered that. Rip. All right, put that aside, that looks really good. And notice, like I said, you know, a lot of that pre-highlight that we did on the edge highlighting stayed, right? So along the crack there, along this edge, we're gonna brighten it up, right? But it did stay, you know? So we don't have to redo too much. That edge that we did with the brush, because we didn't go too heavy and I paint very thin, Right, we're able to get that stripe looking pretty good and with that highlight kind of already sitting there as a mid highlight, if so. You know, remember, I like to take my highlights and, and work with them uh, from dark to light, even though it's a technically a highlight. Starting them at a darker color does wonders for letting you tail them off and get a lot more work out of them. Now I'm going to go in here and this is probably not going to work very well because this paint in the airbrush is so thin, but we might get lucky. It's like a weird fleshy color, actually. So this is just that same color. I just got it right out of the airbrush pot, but it is gonna be a lot more uh, opaque off of the brush if I do it right. So I'm gonna amp up these highlights. That I just talked about. That gets them right where we want them. That looks really well. Really well, looks really good. Grammar, Fuse, it's a thing. This whole language you've been speaking your whole life, get good, scrub. Again, just going right back over these areas that I'd already highlighted. Matching them up with the highlights we did on the gray part. Real easy.
Okay. I'm not really concerned when I do stripes like this on the floor. I'm not real concerned with highlighting this edge, right? Like highlighting the stripe itself, because I'm considering that the stripe was painted on the floor. Now I might just to save myself some effort here, go ahead and highlight this edge right here. And do the same thing over here, just because I had that little blip where it pulled through the uh, uh, the uh, masking a little bit. So I'll just fake it on there. But normally I won't highlight that edge because I don't want to give a dimension to it. I don't want there to be a shadow along this, so it makes it look like it is even millimeters higher than the floor. It's just paint on the floor. So it won't have a highlight on that edge. All right, so you'll notice we haven't highlighted them anywhere here. The only highlight on the stripes follows the lighting on the floor. If it's brighter here, then the stripe gets brighter there and darker here and brighter here and darker there. But you don't edge highlight the stripes. Although if you edge highlight the painted stripes, it makes them look like they have a dimension, that they stand up, that they're embossed or engraved or something like that. So if that's the look you want, then go for it. But if that's not, then uh, avoid edge highlighting any uh, painted on graphics. Now I'm going to come back here and do the same thing with some of these spots where we have the cracks. Because those didn't last, they were too, they weren't bright enough. So we covered those and they went away and the airbrush worked pretty quick. Need to just come back and pick a few of those, not overdo it, make sure that it looks kind of consistent with the way we did it on the concrete part. And we'll just brighten up some of these little holes and cracks and divots and pock marks and whatever we got. Like that. So now the whole surface sells itself as being the same, right? Because all of our highlights are going the same direction on the pock marks, whether they're red. We're just having to use a different color to highlight them, right? You wouldn't highlight them with the same color in the gray. I mean, you could, I guess, since the paint was chipped apart, maybe you would get the concrete color. I prefer to do it like this just because it stays tone on tone, kind of sells it a little bit better. And now what we'll do is paint some block letters on here. I'm thinking just, uh, I'm going to go with just a gray. I'm just going to do them as white, I think. White letters, if that makes sense. And then green light. Yeah. I'm just going to get like a neutral gray. Neutral gray, look at me. I just always paint the base for anything I want to go white with uh, in gray. That way I get that kind of uh, dirty shadow out of it without having to do it secondarily. Pretty much like every other thing I paint. Start with the darkest version of the color that you feel comfortable with on this. And I'm thinking just a, maybe a, maybe a zero here. do uh, stylized lettering here. We'll do fat on the one side here. I'm not going to fill in the, the like little holes in it. I'll leave those red.
kind of purposefully not painting straight down. I've got this angle to the brush so that it doesn't force paint down into any of the divots. There's all these nice textured pock marks on here. I don't want to lose any of that. Kind of keeps me from Putting the paint where I don't want it. Out a little bit. Maybe a one that we want to do. A one. Ones are easy. Do a one. I really want to do the one though. Do I want it? Just line and and T. So Again, when I'm freehanding, I'm just trying to set up shapes. So this is kind of a triangle that comes off of a rectangle. Rectangle first, and then dragging that triangle off to the side again, just using the long drag across the side of the brush, because I don't want to put the gray color of the number down in the crack. Avoid it. Good. Pretty straight. Close enough for government work. We'll assume the guy that painted him was drunk on that day. I'm okay with that. And then, uh, spaceship exterior? Question mark? I don't think we need to go white. We use a spaceship exterior and then we'll move to white just for some highlight. So spaceship exterior, it's one of my favorite colors for when you're painting white and don't want to have white be anything but a, you know, a final highlight color. It's the way we do most of our whites. Paint white without actually using white is the secret. Spaceship exterior and things like golem grays and very, very pale uh, light blues, that's what's going to let you do that kind of work. You can add white to your lightest gray as a 50-50 and get a color that registers as white to the eye. So now what I want to do here is kind of, again, I want this brighter over to our left. Remember everything else gets darker right along this line. So I'm going to put most of my brighter color over here. I'm using very short strokes so that I can keep up with this kind of neat pockmark again. And because these are painted on letters on the floor, we get a lot of freedom we don't normally have when painting. I don't have to blend as nicely. I can have these be a little splotchy looking, like the paint has been worn off by foot traffic and such. And again, just building up my brightness over towards our far left as I go.
knock off most of my paint so that now when I come down here it'll be a lot less opaque won't get as bright of a white Do it all over again with a one. Here I'm just going to take my brush stroke right to left. I'm pulling that light, light gray from the shadow side of the one over to the brighter side. Even it out a little bit on the edge. right to left again but shortening my stroke so I just keep building up brighter and brighter as I go over to that left side where I want my color to really pop as much as it can pop as a beat up painted number one on the floor right Down the side. I don't want to make that shadow to bright spot on it so um, abrupt that it again gives it dimension. I just want to make it look worn and shadowed like the rest of it. So that's why I'm only using two colors and not having a really, really dark color lay in on the shadow side. At some point in time, it becomes three dimensional and we don't want that. We just want it to be painted on the floor. Bingo. There you go. I don't know what the zero one is for, but this is zero one. Corridor zero one. And again, she's going to be standing on here so we can figure out how we're going to place her on there to where that all makes maybe like this. So it kind of doesn't, I, I don't ever like it to where like things that I paint go in right angles. So I probably want to curve it like this, but still have it to where her foot, we didn't literally look at that. Shame on me, but I don't want her foot to step on the number, so I can probably set her on like right like that. That way the lighting doesn't get covered up. The line doesn't go straight across because you don't want to have like big things go parallel or at right angles if you can avoid it. Always find like some sort of interesting angle you can put it at. So I feel like that's going to work really well for her. I don't really even have to weather the lettering much, if at all. Um because we've got this uh you know what i'll do i will go in and grab some of the pock marks and highlight them same way we've been doing the other stuff just like here here with just a very very opaque level of this paint so that we get the same beat up look i was going to maybe bypass this, but I think it's worth it. Again, the smallest amount of paint makes the biggest difference sometimes. And this is one of those where I'm just to spend a little bit of effort paint to cooperate here. Right along the 
just highlight again. That works pretty good. Now everything looks consistent. The lettering, the zero's a little off on the top right, but I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Good enough for government work. Now let's do the light, I think. I think, I think. Actually, no, what I wanna do first is highlight a little bit more of the outside. And you know what? I can even do that with this color that I got. Spaceship exterior for the win. Right, we're going to go ahead and highlight right up here. I want to grab a little bit of this brighter spaceship exterior and bring it down the side just a little bit, kind of split the difference. I'm not going to bring this bright color all the way to the end of my highlight. I want it to live like mostly right up here at the top and then come about halfway down and tail off and disappear. Now my my highlight gets a little bit brighter as it comes out of this bright spot where I've got it right up here dead center. And I just kind of have that disappear off into the side. So then I'm going to take a really, really thin go at the spaceship exterior. And just kind of right here in the middle, squidge some light in here. Just a last little. Push of light and shine on that very top edge like that. That then blends out into our edge highlight here. Play around and stipple some in there. Bingo. Just that little punch of brightness on the edge helps a lot. People are like, why are you spending so much time on a base? <laughs> All right, same thing up here. We had this bright spot that used to triangle in right here. So we're going to carry on and grab it, dis make it disappear, and then a little bit of amplification of this area right in here. Again, I can stipple to do this because the concrete's kind of rough hewn right up here anyway. So this just kind of helps keep that texture going. And then right in here as well. So our bright spots right here. So I'll tail that highlight off as it comes out towards this edge. And it is a little bit into there. Again, just kind of lightly stipple my brighter light in a small triangle shape up here at the top. Pointillism for those of you that are classically trained. Stippling. Take a little bit of brighter color right here in the middle on this little pie piece up here too. Our finger to blur it and bingo. Now what I can also do is along this edge, pick out some of these like corners, little spiky edges where the crack is and highlight those up too. And then here, as we drag in close to our light source, go ahead and brighten that up, anticipating the OSL. Here, like on the corner. And because we're going to throw a different color on here, I can even cheat and use that same color, even though it doesn't match with the red really well. All right, I can do it on this edge just the same. Our OSL color will make it render it hue neutral at the end of the day since this is just a gray anyway. But I can use it like that to highlight our red right around where I want that OSL to have a little bit of punch. 
I'm going to have to highlight it again when we drop the OSL on there with the, the green color, whatever it winds up being. But just for playing around, I can kind of tail it off, right? See, I want it to just disappear as it goes off over here right? into our normal red. Same thing down here. It just kind of disappears into that mid-gray highlight that I had and just gets bright right in here around this light socket. Right here at the corner and stuff. Bingo. And if I thin it right, I feel like after seeing the way it worked right there, we can even do some cool stuff right here. We can have it be a good way to just highlight this edge just a little bit like that. It doesn't pull away from that red too much. If I thin it just enough, then I can actually punch it over the red, and the red of the mahogany still kind of sits center stage. The spaceship exterior doesn't overtake it and make it look like gray. I still get the feel along that line that it's red here and then changes colors up here, even though it's the same color. Sometimes you get lucky. Not really luck, just paint and thin. Grab a couple of these spots where I know you got a little bit of that detail corners poking. You don't want to do this whole line bright, right? You want it to just be certain spots so it gives it that broken feel. And bingo. There you go. And that's pretty damn good just there without the OSL. I mean, that's a good looking con broken concrete base. We've got a good amount of shadow and depth to it. Uh, if you weren't painting O1s and stripes on it, you know, you could see how just doing the airbrush part and the highlight part was almost no time at all. And then, you know, doing all the other crazy stuff like the stripes and such are just other added details to do. And we'll go in and do the OSL on that real quick. Iron Headed, what's going on, man? Then I'm on there, Commission. But yeah, these are, uh, this one's for Daphne from uh, Scooby Doo, right? Or, uh, corporate uh, security agent or whatever the hell they're called, right? She'll sit on this, this base that we're doing now. So we got to do the light. So we got to figure out a color. Want to do green. We want to do yellowy green. The jade green, like we did on this. I think we need to do like a yellowy green, probably. Because I don't want to do the same jade green. I don't want to just turn that into a light. I don't know that we need to tie it in that much, although it's not bad. It's not a bad idea. It plays really well. And it isn't exactly the same as her bow tie, because her little tie is yellowy green. So I guess we'll do the jade again. Let me see if I can figure out the colors that I used. We've got green RLM 25 we could use. We haven't used that for anything. That's a pretty good color. We do angel green into the green RLM 25. Not bad, but olive? No, not olive gray. Where's olive? Olive. I have my desk is a disaster like this is about as bad as it gets right now i've got more paint on the desk than i do in the damn uh paint holders not good not the way it's supposed to work fuse why you do this where is olive there it is i think i'll start with olive green it's got just enough bl blue kick to it that it'll give us our dark shade pretty well and I think I want to get to the light green RLM 25. So what I'll probably do is just mix these then after I do the olive. I'll, I'll just mix in the RLM 25 because I, I don't know. I might have a color here that works, but whatever. Whatever, man. We'll just go with this. I did not. I did not iron headed. I did the. It was funny. Somebody else asked that too. And I was like, you know, I painted the, the nylons on the leg, the pantyhose, and it was right when I finished those that I go, I should have been streaming this. And then I turned the stream on, but that was weeks ago when we did the bulk of her. We did the highlights on her today and like the halo on the hair and stuff like that. But uh, all, all the bulk of her was painted weeks ago. And it, it literally is my fault. I was just sitting here painting, listening to an audiobook, picking up different models. And I said, oh, I got to paint her pantyhose. And I just started doing it. And then when I was done, I was like, oh, I should have streamed that. I didn't even, I didn't video it or photo it or anything. I'm an idiot. <laughs> it's just the way it's the way it goes, man. Again, I forgot to clean the airbrush after we did the red. I is bad. I blame you guys because I've told you, don't let me paint straight out of the airbrush cup. It makes me forget to clean the damn thing. 
and you didn't remind me. You people can't be trusted. But um, like I was saying before, Ironheaded, uh, if you just treat painting hose, if it's a Caucasian style skin or a you know an olive style skin that you're doing, just paint the hose as if you were painting African style skin tones. Um, and then as you work towards your lighter highlights on the legs in that case, use your middle flesh color, your mid to shade side of things rather than like the highlight color of flesh that you're painting. So in my case for Caucasian flesh, I would have used probably tanned flesh on her and mixed it in uh, over time with the black brown. So I think I did most of her hose uh, completely with model color black brown and tanned flesh. Right, with a little bit of black that I would add in for shading uh, on the pantyhose as I go. But you just keep blending these together. And then maybe a little bit of barbarian flesh in there at the highest end. Right? But I just mix the colors as I go and treat it as if I'm painting African flesh uh, with a little bit more attention to the shadows. Because the shadows aren't natural when you have pantyhose because there's that layer of fabric. So you want to kind of treat it as a as a little bit darker than you would normally do for skin, probably. Because like I was saying, I'll show you in just a second. Um, the thing that sells the pantyhose and the sheer factor is, is, is much the fact that the rest of her skin is not that color as it is the way you paint the pantyhose. Or sheer cloth. It doesn't have to be pantyhose, but you know how you paint anything else. It's the fact that you, know, you have enough of the color of the fabric blended in with the skin so that the skin on the model that doesn't have any of the fabric, you know, covering it or blocking it or whatever. So even if you're doing like that Medusa model with sheer cloth on her face and all that, the thing that's really going to help you sell it is, you know, the fact that you make it different enough from the skin that is not covered up, right? That the eyes immediately are drawn to the fact that there's something different about this. Let me get the rest of this mahogany out of the airbrush real quick because the color we're going to spray is green. Oh, it's olive, so the mahogany is not going to kill it if it gets a little bit in there. All right, bingo. Set that aside. And then, you know, what I was showing on her is that, you know, it looks great. It's got, you know, I mean, other than like the line on the back of the calf, right, it, it's got the pantyhose. But if I cover her, that could just as easily just be African skin, right, other than the shadows being a little too dark because of the pantyhose part, right? So that could sell itself as just being uh, black skin. But it's the fact that the rest of her body has got, you know, that paler tan Caucasian flesh to it that helps sell the whole thing. So just blend and paint as if you're painting darker flesh and whatever color the hose are. Think in terms of like I use black brown because I just want it to be black hose. But let's say she wanted to be wearing uh, blue hose. You could do blue and just take a very dark blue and start mixing it with your flesh to do the same thing. In the case of blue, you're probably going to want, you know, a, a very black brown or a black to mix with it, too, because the blue will never be as dark shadow wise as this. So you'd use a lot more black to help get your shades out of it. But then just do it. It's going to be a weird skin color. But at the end of the day, it's really going to sell what you're trying to do. Prime time. What's happening? Oh, your, your, your uh, internet's killing you? I think we're good on this end. We got no problems. No problems. All right, so we're going to do some olive. We're going to uh, come in on this base. We're going to paint the OSL on the floor lights like we've done on the other ones where we did the blue on these. Now we're just going to paint a green OSL floor light on this one. So I'm going to start with a very dark green. One of the big keys to doing OSL effects is that you start with a color much darker than the light would be. Um, you know, we want a bright kind of jady green uh, lighting effect on here, but we need to start with a very dark color because that uh, is going to give us the filter that we require to have the green light register at the edges, you know, because it's just bright in the center, kind of like the blue here, right? The underneath of this blue is very dark that actually reaches out much further than just the pinpoint lighting that's on there. Same with the reds, right, where we did all of our red lights on the, the Pan O guys. Right, the dark red halos out much further than the bright red, and that's what really sells the lighting. If you just keep it all as a bright color, then it's going to look like spilled paint, no matter how much you feather it and how much hard work you do to blend it. Start dark. Doesn't mean it has to be like you know uber dark, but start dark and thin the hell out of it if you're doing it like this. Like you're going to see me paint with thin, like paint that's basically water with a little bit of green in it.
you'll notice that now that I have the paint mixed in the cup, look at how when I draw the paint up from the bottom and put it on the wall of the airbrush, see how little opacity there is? It's like an ink. That's how thin I go. That way your blend is super controlled. You're not going to harm any of the colors that are underneath. You're just going to filter this green over it. Now, the trick is that it's very, very wet, right? So this is almost like spraying with water. So to keep it from spidering out, right, you got to always be moving your airbrush. So I'm going to get in here until I start seeing color. Then I've got the nozzle flicking, and I'm just going to do this radial deal with my airbrush like that, right? So it starts dropping that dark green on there. But notice how it's not opaque enough to overtake my gray for my zero or any of my shading. Oh, everything still stays. But it is super wet. So I'm going to hit it with just some air to kind of knock it down. I don't want to hit it when it's wet again. Once I see that it's lost its sheen, then I'll go in and start adding some more color in. Again, using that radial spray. And notice how it's influencing this gray out here towards the edge as I make my pattern bigger so I get that green feel right but it's not changing much of the color it's just filtering over the reds still look red they just have this weird filter of green the bright you know color on the lettering still has its coloring it's just now it's going to be the one that's influenced the most because it's the brightest color closest to the green so the zero will turn kind of a green but that's where the light would be saturating it anyway so that's fine again just hit it with some air And then one last time, I want to bring the green a little bit further down the line here. I'm just going to kind of get in close, kind of feather the green down this trough. And then out a little bit around the light again, like so. Okay, so now notice I've got the green light that goes down this little trough. Push it out this way just a little bit too. Bingo. Super simple. Easy to do. Because I'm these lights are sunken in the ground, right? Notice that I haven't, like, like I'm not pushing it super far out from the light. But I want it to go far enough that I can get the feel of the whole thing glowing. So, you know, artistic license is forcing me, or not forcing me, but allowing me to kind of push this further out than it might normally be. Right? Just so I get that cool look. So there you go. So there's the area where my green light is. It's all centered on the floor there, right? And gives me that cool glow. And the dark green, like I said, shouldn't be super hyper opaque and visible on there because the next colors are going to be what I go more opaque with. So this, the light green RLM that I start dumping on here is what's going to start getting brighter. Um, and I'm thinking I'm just going to go straight with the light green RLM. I'm going to dump all this out. I'm not even going to bother mixing them because I'm happy with where we're at. Being able to run that olive color so thin gives me a really, really cool green when it hits over that gray and everything. Whereas, I mean, this olive color by its very nature is super dark, right? So notice how by going super duper water thin, I get a much different green laid out here. The core, the core components of it are still there. The bluish green is still there, um, but over the gray and over the red, it's a different, color altogether. So that's kind of the thing that is hard to get through to people's heads is that sometimes when you're painting like I do, the color you choose from your rack is not the color that you're ultimately looking for, but the method that you uh, apply it, the colors you apply it over, the thickness that you apply it with will make it appear to be the color you were looking for. Does that make sense? I just totally confused you. Generally start darker than you want is what I'm saying. Like this dark green is not what I want, but when I run it super thin, it gives me exactly the value and hue that I was looking for. So now we're gonna go light green RLM 25. This is a color that I generally use for doing verdigris, but it's a really great bright kind of a odd green. I think it's gonna look cool over the top of this. And again, we're gonna use it very thin at first and then we'll build it up so that we can have it blend out with this olive as it sits at the perimeter because it's not the same kind of green, right? It doesn't have the same like yellow component to it. It's a little bit more desaturated neutral and the top doesn't want to screw on you see i've only got like a little bit of paint in there like just all the way down to the bottom of the neck and then i'm going to add flow improver to fill it up to the top of the cup basically 
Now I've got flow improver just coming in on the cup. So I've probably got twice as much or three times as much flow improver in here as I do paint. And I'm starting with model air paint anyway, so the air paint's already thin. So technically I probably got, you know, 80% flow improver, 20% paint in this mix. This is gonna be a little bit different. Notice how the last one, this time when I pull it up on the wall, it's got a little bit more opacity, but it's still very translucent. You know, most people, when they're doing OSL, they run into the problem of painting with very opaque paint because they're trying to get an effect. And they don't realize that, you know, you the part of the effect of lighting is that the, the natural colors beneath the light hitting it need to play as much of a part. And so if you cover all that up with an opaque color, then you've defeated the purpose. It just looks like paint on a surface. All right. So again, get in here real tight. Kind of aim right into the middle of the lighting there and just kind of move, swirl my brush around in that spherical motion, then do it and start pulling back more. I'm starting to build up that color in the center of the lights there. And I want to then extend that out to match a lot of what I did with the olive, but not 100%, right? I'm going to push it a little bit down the trough. Bring it out, but I want to keep it a little tighter in here. So, and then I'll start building it up right in the center where the lights are. Using that radial motion again. Just air. I like that. Now we'll add a little bit of what color is going to be good to add to this to get us brighter. I think ivory is going to be the color. So we're going to just go in with ivory. Just going to put a drop of ivory in here start with one it's model color again so it's pretty opaque as it is and that should brighten us up quite a bit yep and i'll need to add more thinner because the model color is as dense as it is so it's going to be way more opaque than i want to deal with Almost time for me to eat. I'm hungry. I had fun streaming on Saturday, though. I think this was productive. I'm never as productive as when I don't stream, but I'd much rather paint with you guys and chat than uh, sit around and listen to my books all the time. All right. So again, now I'm going to get in really close. I mean, to give you an idea how close I am, I'm painting it about like this. Right, about a quarter to a half inch away. Right, start building up that brightness on the center there. Again, it's super thin, so I got to make sure I'm drying. So this is just air. Every time I see a little bit of color build up, then I just want to make sure I cure it before I go after it again. So sorry if you guys probably, I don't know if you can see color hitting this or not, maybe. Same area, right in the middle there. Broaden it out a little bit. I'm gonna come here and start feathering the outside edge of this. Very specifically, not using the distance of the brush to the model now. I'm just actually guiding this around and spraying in real close to those edges to get that glow. 
Okay. Like so. More air. Get in there again. Repeat as necessary till I get the brightness that I like. So I'm just gonna hit it again, kind of feather out. Like so, brightening it up, making that kind of star shape that runs a little bit of brightness down both of the links of the thing, a little bit past all these edges, but keeping it pretty tight so that all my other greens live in and around that edge and I don't overtake that zero too much. I might have overtaken the zero just a little bit much, but I'm gonna live with it. Still looks like a number, so I'm all right with it. All right, so that's pretty good right there. I'm going to push it one more time, I think. Make sure I don't have this tip dry. It feels like it's, yep, it's got a little bit of tip dry. So I'm going to take the nozzle cover off and get in just with a straight needle on here. Keep brightening up right in the center. A little bit further out on all of these. Bam, that looks pretty good. Now what I wanna do right here is stop and again, do what I told you guys to tell me not to do. I'm gonna take, take paint out of the cup with my brush, but we have to airbrush again, so don't worry. This time I got this, I got this. I'll remember to clean it. All right, but I'm gonna take paint straight out of the cup off of the brush here. It's super thin, so I'm gonna load up with a lot of paint and then I'm gonna, with this same color, I'm going to amplify these edges a little bit, right? Come in here and start punching these up. I did that. Just drag that edge out a little bit further than I can with the airbrush. Otherwise, I'll get too much green out here, but I want it to be that kind of green feel. Same thing over on this side, Got a little bit of this. And punch up along this edge here a lot. Thing over here. Here. It's real smart to go ahead and use the color you have in your pot so you're not trying to, you know, adjust or if, especially if you're running like a custom mix in your airbrush. Just paint with the stuff right out of your airbrush. It's gonna be, if you're painting like I am, it's gonna be super thin and hard to control sometimes. You're just gonna have to make sure you get most of it off. You can't just go to the model like I'm taking most of the paint off. Otherwise it'll be so wet that it'll start pooling on the model. Don't want that. Play with that until I'm satisfied. Like that's looking pretty good. Starting to get that glow of green light on there. And now I'll go to damn near pure ivory. Ah, I don't know if I want to use pure ivory. No, I'm just going to keep diluting this color. Not diluting, but I'm going to just keep mixing with this color. So I'm going to dump some out because I got way too much paint in the cup. I got this is too much paint. If you're painting with that much paint in your airbrush, you're either painting a car or you got too much paint. You should never have your airbrush filled with tons and tons of paint, it's a waste. Because that paint will start to cure in the airbrush before you're done painting it, I can guarantee, unless you're painting like a Night Titan or something huge, where you need lots of, amounts of, lots of paint uh, over a very short period of time. So I just leave enough in there that I can mix and I'm gonna put more ivory in here, rather than try to do straight ivory. Straight ivory sometimes is just a little too yellow. So I'm gonna put two or three drops of ivory in there. So I know I'm pushing it to the extreme for highlight, um, but I'm gonna maintain a little bit of this mint green, which is what I'm looking for. Like I don't wanna go straight white. On the blue, I went straight white. On the red, I mixed out like this. 
All right, so I feel like that's probably not bright enough. Maybe? Question mark? No, I feel like I want a little bit brighter. I'm going to put a little bit more ivory in there. Do Luna Moss. Two. Two old moss. Not a word. So that's going to get me as close to ivory as I'm probably comfortable going. It's like all saturated. You can't even tell there's color in there from the camera. It's too bright. That's as close to ivory, but it still has that mint green feel to it. So it's a good way that you're actually what you're doing here is as opposed to thinking in terms of it ivory being highlighting is that you're basically shading the ivory with the green at this point. To use language, it might be a little bit more uh, understandable as to what I'm doing. That's too opaque. I need to thin that down just a hair. We dumped out most of our flow improver, so I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit more. Paint off of the needle here. Again, through this whole process doing OSL, you want most of it to be super, super thin. You can you can uh, go a little bit more opaque as you go brighter. You just have to be careful, right? Don't get to the point to where you're going to get speckling. Don't get to the point to where you're going to make it look like paint, right? All through the process, it needs to be translucent enough that you can build up layers, even with your highlight color, and that it's not just bang, spraying on white. So I'll run through a little bit of the cup back under here, just so I know I've got, that's not good. I think I got some sort of gunk on the needle. So give me just a second. I feel like I've got needle guard is starting to log. Been spraying quite a bit without any problems. That's good. But yeah, I've got a little bit of paint. The, the paint on the needle guard will start to build up as it, uh, as you spray more and more. And so if you get a little bit of paint built up like this, you can see like most of the paint is starting to build up on this side. That'll create a, a, a little bump in that. And so now the circle is not round. So when the paint comes out, it'll spray off in a different direction. Generally, it'll kick around this corner and broaden the cone of spray. And when I'm doing like super detail work, like we're about to put the brush like right on the model and paint each of those individual little lights, those four little lights in there. So I can't, I can't afford to have this shoot off at a weird angle. It needs to be a straight cone. It needs to be very exact for what we're about to do. Looks like we got it. Yep, that's good. Feels good. Let's do it. Cat back on. Now we're going to get in. I'm going to do each one of these individual four lights first. First thing is get in here, rest it on my thumb. Real tight, kind of jiggle that. Right, bang, there's one, that top right one. Bang, number two. Bang number three, and bang number four. So the goal there is just to get each of the individual lights on their own without overtaking the color underneath them, see? So I'm not spraying the whole inside of that square. I'm just trying to get the lights themselves, okay? Like that. Now, you could say, yeah, you could paint that with a brush fuse and not lose your mind. Yeah, but this next part is kind of cool, right? So now what I want to do is I want to point at each one of these little lights and then just kind of do a small flick so I get a little bit of a brightness towards all these edges, like this corner here. So, I don't know if you 
guys can see this exactly. Sorry if my hat's getting in the way. Like so. And like, if it'll work, well, kind of like so. I feel like the paint's still too thick is what I feel like. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of tip dry. There we go. There we go. Bingo. All right, so now I get a nice little blast coming off of each of those. Got each of my little lights. You can see it better here where the camera's not blowing it all out, right? So I've got each one of those little LEDs kind of glaring off into the corner and straight away from them. So it gives me that nice halo, right? That's nice and bright. And now I'll go in with the brush. We're done with the airbrush now. That's all we'll do for airbrush work. And now it's just highlighting all that. We'll use the same color right out of the pot, though, like I told you guys not to let me do. So we're going to do that again, all right? So tell me not to do it, and then I'll ignore you, and we'll do it anyway. Uh, I need a smaller brush now. But the Uno or the Zero works. We'll use our Detcord Zero. These are our Slowfuse Gaming Super Detail Brushes, the Detcords. They are a synthetic Kalinske. They are fan-freaking-tastic for this kind of work. Uh, we did just now release them in twos, threes, and fours. You've been seeing me use the number two all day long. Everything else you've seen me do has been the number two. All right, so what I want to do here, let me make sure I'm not getting my hat in the picture here. I want to come in here very, very close to the light box itself and start brightening these edges right along where the LEDs are, but only right where they are. Notice how I'm not pulling that line all the way across the box here. I want it right on these corner spots. Here, coming into the trough, whatever the hell we want to call this thing. tail off goes out again just right here behind the LED along this that wall. And that's why I like using the airbrush to give me that little bit of uh, comet tail because then when you go in and you highlight just that area right there, right, it looks so much better. Got this nice hard line where the LED shines right up on that wall. And then you've got that nice little whipped comet tail of highlight that goes off from each of those LEDs. So it looks like each one of them is its own little point of, uh, of uh, light generation, which it is. Now I'm going to come in on the tip of each of these and just do a nice bright edge. Kind of almost like a drop just at the 
if we're looking at it like this, call it the one o'clock or the two o'clock on each of those, just to brighten up the LED on one side to make it look kind of shiny. All right. And then the last but not least, we're going to take the olive color that we did at first. Uh, this. Dirk Diggly. Sorry, yeah, I probably went off stream. I apologize. Doing this fine detail work, sometimes I miss. Sometimes I miss. Hopefully you're catching up with whatever you are, I was doing that you missed anyway. Uh, all right, so now what I want to do is get this fairly thin like an ink for this olive. The olive is the dark green that we used at first, okay? And the goal here is to have this very thin dark color right, that I get in here and do right around the base of these LEDs. Think of it like a wash almost. Hard trying to get it not everywhere else. I'm just trying to make the base of the LED dark. It really makes it's that last bit of punch that it gives to the OSL effect. And I'm on a still using that zero brush. Just that little bit of darkness, that halo of darkness around the base of the LED really, really makes all the brightness we put on there punch out even more. Remember, I'm always telling you, the brighter the paint you use, the darker the other paints you've used look. Same goes with the dark paint. Put a dark paint on, and if you don't feel like you really want to push a color to white, right? Like here, I don't want to use white if I can avoid it. So I just push this olive down into the shadows where I want it, and now that ivory mix that we did as our bright quote unquote brightest color becomes even brighter okay, and i think on these bases i did it around yeah i shadowed the box itself too so we're going to go ahead and do that just because we did it on those two i shadowed these uh these straight lines back in here too There's a dingleberry on the resin right there, so I'm not going to do that one. Bam. Got a little bit of color. This side of this LED, so I'm just going to go back in with my brighter color because I got a little bit of that dark green right there. Try to punch these back up so it doesn't look like the dark green is on the top of the LED anywhere. And I'm going to go because this paint is so thin coming out of the airbrush where I did that highlighting. I'm going to go back and reinforce that highlighting real quick too. All right, so like right in here. And the paint is as thin as I'm painting with it. After it dries, you almost lose all of its punch. I'm going to layer it until we can kick it up and make it. Bright as we need to.
Bam. Green OSL floor light on our 01 concrete base. For what's her nuts. And again, like I said, it'll probably sit like this with her feet straddling it like this so that the light and everything, I'll, I can do a little bit of the green OSL on her foot if I need to. But I don't want to, I don't, I try not to have things run perpendicular, like I said earlier, or completely horizontally parallel to, you know, the model's angle. So doing something like this makes sense. Then set her across it like this, so that the angles are, provide a, something cool to look at. There you go. Bingo. Hope that helps. We've done quite a bit with these bases. We did these, and then we, of course, did the, uh, the red lights on the Pano ones, too. So same exact process that I've done for every single one of these, just the colors change. Always just start dark and then work up to your brightest color. Now I'm doing some pretty exaggerated, crazy airbrushing to paint each and every single one of those little LEDs. You could definitely do that with a brush. I prefer it with the airbrush, just so like I said, you get that little comet tail of highlight that comes out of the light box that makes it seem like a light glow. Whereas if you paint that, you're going to spend a lot of time blending it. If you can, if you have the airbrush and you have the control with your airbrush, it's easier just to get in there. Like you saw me painting literally like an eighth of an inch away from this top of that, uh, the top of those LEDs and just feather that trigger and you'll get it, you know, practice that. But I mean, we're talking about the LEDs themselves are no bigger than the tip of that zero brush barely. Right. So some crazy airbrush work there, but it's easy if you just keep practicing. But like I say, you can do the same thing with the brush. Uh, you just spend a little bit of time uh, blending it so that you get that comet tail, not look like, you know, you have lines coming out. You're just going to want to kind of glaze those little bitty tails on there. What's going on, Kenny? Did Bonet kick your ass today? When I tuned in for a second, she was kicking your ass. So you can't say no, because I saw some of it. <laughs> Kev Rob, how much for that brush? Which brush? Which one are we talking about? When did you ask that? Like 20 minutes ago? Which brush? All of these are about the same price. I think all of the bomb wicks, the deck cord bomb wicks are like, uh, uh, the new two threes and fours, I want to say are eight bucks a piece, seven ninety nine. Don't quote me on that. You have to look at the store. Uh, and then the zeros go down to, I think the same, I think they start at like seven ninety nine, and then up maybe the, maybe the four is like ten ninety nine, right. For the large size ones. I've been using the two all day. That's what I've been painting. That's what we've been painting all the models with. So, uh, and then I just switched over to the zero, which is part of the debt cord set. Uh, these come, you can buy them individually or you can buy them in a set of five. They are a one down to a X 10. The X 10 is like ridiculous, right? The X 10 is this one. So just to give you an idea of sizing. So we go down to like ridiculous paint eyes size or, you know, crazy uh, cross hatching, texturing and things like that. And then as big as the two, three and the four on the deck cords, which I've been loving. Um, the, the two, three and four, the fat ones have just been spectacular, spantacular, span, fans, fans, physic, fan, fantastic. They've been great. Are we shot? Should the mini also get some of the OSL? Like I said, probably at, uh, depending on how it places on the floor, I haven't been worrying about that, to be honest with you. Um, whether it's something that, you know, like this one, the, the Reverend Moira with this, you know, maybe I glaze a little bit of blue on there. I'm not super worried about it. Uh, only because the overall context of the models that I'm painting, you know, the bases that I'm doing in the way that I'm doing is a little overkill for what I was trying to get away with anyway. Um, but I will, I'll make them look good. You know, like I'll go back. That'll be the last thing I do. So something like this, where if I have a foot that steps into any part of the halo of the light, I'll go back and glaze a little bit of red on the foot, but I'm not going to airbrush it. Obviously I'm just going to do it with a brush just enough to give it a little bit of a filter of color on there so that the light continues to play out as a three dimensional thing. And yeah, hers, depending on how the angle of her foot lays on this base may get some on the back of her heel. Or something but i'm not gonna go back and like osl like her, the upskirt shot of her or anything like that i'm not gonna worry about it uh falarian asked was it really necessary to paint the gray beneath if you go so hard on the green now well okay so yeah because you're not there's nowhere on this base that's just green 
right? All of the light, all of the colors here are influencing one another, whether it's readily apparent to you or not. Like down in the trough there where the brightest of my greens are, some of that gray is still influencing that, right? Some of my gray is still influencing this shadow as it comes around. The only spot where we might, well, I don't know. I mean, the only spot where we probably covered it 100% is our edge highlighting. And obviously on the LED itself, right? Because I mean, you can still see how the green, I can still find the side of my zero in there. You know, the camera can't catch everything, but if I do this, you'll see it a little bit better, right? The red is still playing underneath the green here. The grays are still playing underneath the red even, you know? So the layering style of painting that I do guarantees that your whole palette on the model starts to come together and you don't feel like you've ever got colors that exist outside of other ones when you're doing something like this, right? Where it's red and white paint over gray concrete with a light shining on it, you know? Now it's different if we're painting uh, you know, different batches of clothing, you know, like on her, right? It, I don't need to have the purple underneath the, the skin tone and stuff. If it's different textures and different materials, then yeah, you, you don't need to, to do that at all. Whenever I do something like this, where I know that overall, this piece of floor is all concrete. So I paint it all like concrete. Then I layer up all the other colors over it. The same way if you went out and painted a red stripe on your concrete and it started to fade in the sun, the concrete color eventually starts showing through it. So if you paint with that in mind, you always have the ability to choose what level of weathering shows, how beaten it is, how brand new it is, because you can obviously color the gray completely over with the, with the, like, well, you don't want to do it with the OSL. The OSL always needs to have some of the gray underneath it so it acts like light and not spilled paint. But like for the red stripe, I could continue painting red until it's completely opaque red and none of the gray influences at all, and that would make the paint look like it's brand new on top of the gray concrete. Because this weathered concrete has cracks and is beaten up, I didn't do that. I let the gray still show well, through huzzah, some of the red. Huzzah. Makes sense. Throw back my Men's and Earth with the three months. Thank you, my friend. Delight. Can I show a finished model, uh, Porter, uh, with a base to see how light is painted on the model? Do I have anything here that has OSL from a base that's already on a model? No, but I can do it to one of these. Let's just go ahead and do it. If, if enough people are interested, then we've got a guy here that we need to do it on his foot. So let's just do it on his foot. How about that? This guy, as a matter of fact, the guy that we just picked up, right? His boots are done. He's at that point where we can do that and not change anything, right? So this guy has a red lamp on the floor and you can see how the glow of the dark red encroaches on his foot or his foot encroaches on it. So we'd have a little bit of red light, plus his armor is white. So, you know, the white reflective armor is going to pick up some of the red. Right. So I'll show you what I would do. And I might do a little bit more than what I was intending on this guy just because. Right. So um, this started out, if I can remember, I need to remember what color red I started these guys out with. It was, oh boy, I don't know. I think it was like crusted sore, maybe? Question mark. Chaotic red, maybe? I'm not going to remember this at all i don't want to go in with just red red because this was a boy i forget what this combo was i thought it was kind of like crusted sore let's try crusted sore first i feel like that's what it was i may be wrong because we did the uh the red and i highlighted the red up with whites to make it sort of pinkish so it wasn't just a a color and now i've forgotten what the hell i used I think it was either Crusted Sore or like Dragon Red or something, but one of these will work. So the goal is that I need it really, really super thin. And if you're not used to... Here, let me bring my palette over here. Palette cam, I didn't reset, so it's not working. Um, but if I bring this... What the hell did I just drop? Oh, my mixing brush. Um, let me grab that, or I will step on it and break it. So if you're not familiar with how I paint, uh, I, I paint like watercolor when I do these types of effects. So here's our paint. I pull a little bit out of the drop and then I keep adding water to it until it gives me this translucence like this that you see. So this is the paint I'm painting with, not the actual paint up here that's, you know, full body that's like, you know, normal paint that you're used to. So I just keep bringing water over into it until I get this glaze super, super thin. And that's what I'm gonna be using to show you what I'm about to do. I'm going to take my number two brush. Before I go to the model, now that I've got paint on here, I'm going to take it and put most of the paint on my finger so that I don't have a big wet uh, glop of uh, paint about to go over here. And then I'll just kind of come in here and lightly glaze this over 
everything, including my white. And the black of the shoe. And again, kind of hitting You don't want, kind of like a wash, you don't want it to build up anywhere where you get like, you know, gloppy looking uh, dark spots because this isn't supposed to be paint or dirt. It's just reflective color, right? So notice how we get that little bit of pinkish. It almost doesn't matter what red I use as long as it doesn't have like a lot of orange or some color base to it that's different than the light that I've got down here initially, right? So I just want to make sure I'm not building up too much color in recesses and stuff. And then I just keep banging on here until I get the level of red I'm comfortable with. Use my finger to dab it a little bit. Come up the side of the thigh here a bit. All right, keep hitting the black boot because even though the black won't show the red initially at a very high level, still having it there sells it, right? And there you go. I mean, that's about all I do. It's literally that simple. See how we get that little bit of red glow on the back of the boot heel there? Easy. Probably a little bit more on the instep right here. The key is that this paint is barely paint at all. It's water with a little bit of red in it is what it is. I want to make it seem like the light is brighter, then I just keep adding red. Layer over it like that. Boom. Now you got light on his boot. Now, I say it's really that simple. It is really that simple. The problem is getting used to painting with thin paint is one of the things that we teach constantly around here. And it is not the most comfortable thing for some people to do to get used to that before it, you know, uh, doesn't give you a good consistent finish. Uh, you know, acts kind of weird when you put it on the model and things like that. But I mean, that right there gives us a really nice consistency. It doesn't overtake my whites and my grays and my shadows and my highlights. All my edge highlighting still shows through it because the paint is literally just a slight filter of color over what you've already painted. Hey, somebody likes us. Tempest, thank you so much for the follow. And so all of a sudden now that looks like a light on the floor. And that's all I'll have to do. So it's not spending a lot of time. You can do that with airbrush if you were to do this all put together. But I painted the bases separate, stuck the model that was already painted on it. So I'll just glaze it on like this and get that, that glow effect on there. And obviously, the more color you push on the model, it means the brighter this light is. And since I've kept this light fairly narrow band here, it's not really overtaking anything. Then I'll only just barely hit some with red like that. Awesome. What's going on, man? Good to see you. Thank you for that. Take it easy, Flarian. Have a good one if I missed you. I probably missed him. That's been like 12 minutes ago. I'm horrible. I'm a horrible person. Yeah, so hopefully that helped. You know, we, uh, we've we been able to do this whole base. We started from scratch on this base. So you guys got to see again how I do my bases in, in this kind of, you know, uh, contextual sense with the infinity stuff, especially making all these kind of fit together. I really like what we've done uh, here with the, the green, red, and blue lights on these bases, right? Obviously, I think it was a good idea to show just how I'm going to glaze the red to get, or in the green and the blue on the uh, models so that you know you get the feel that the light is shining up on them right so all these came out really nice uh we chose this is the only base like this because she's the only model that's different than all the rest right so she with her colors we painted her like daphne from scooby-doo and so we just picked a, a different coloration because she's a mercenary she could be used with any army whereas the nomads got the the green and bluish bases to offset all of their red armor uh, and of course, the Pano guys got the uh, the red lights to offset all the cooler blues and neutral whites and grays that are on them. Um, so 
I'm really stoked with how this is coming out. If I could just get off my butt and get them finished, then uh, I'm sure Shogoth would be happy. He could be playing Infinity, and I could have more desk space. <laughs> there's, there's only a million Infinity models here. But as far as OSL goes, even if you're not doing it on a flat surface, if you're doing it on, I mean, our the big model we always used to show was the uh, um, the uh, Nina from Breath of Fire. She's not within arm's reach, so I can't show you that. But, I mean, I think we did some on, on Mortarian. Yeah, like the green kind of pulsing glow from the weird stuff on his scythe. You know, the goal is to just make sure that you give it kind of a dark outer glow and then build up brightness as you get towards the, you know, the center or the place where the light would start from. But you can do it on all sorts of shapes. And actually, it's really, really cool when you do it on shapes that are irregular because then the light plays and picks up on all the angles. It'll be fun as we paint these, uh, whatever the hell these things are, these fins on the back of the scythe. I'll have to go back and do more OSL on them where they wrap around. You know, we were kind of early doing it on this because somebody asked me to do copper metallic. So we just did the blade like it was copper with the OSL glow on it. But you can do it on anything. The key is literally just start with a darker color than you want your light to be. So if it's blue, start with dark blue, right? We've shown how to do like the headlamps on, on uh, rhinos, right? You just want to start with a halo of darker blue and then build your brighter blue up and narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down until you're basically just painting like the point of light with white almost. Right? So you get that saturation so it looks more like, you know, glowing lights as opposed to paint. I mean, I, it, it sounds stupid for me to always say that, that, hey, you know, sometimes if you do it wrong, it just looks like you put paint on it. Well, of course, we're just putting paints on things, but we're trying to make paint register in the brain as something other than just paint. And so you can do it in all sorts of ways. And this was just done real quick with the hairbrush and then very little brush work just to highlight a couple of things. So it's, it's real simple to do when you get your head wrapped around the fact that it's all about the angle you paint at and starting dark and working bright. You know, like for these headlights, you can't paint them straight on. You got to paint them all like this, like where the light is, is shooting down so that you're hitting these bright edges with light because that's the light would angle down and hit them and less so on this side of the fender, right? And less so like up here is not going to have as much light on that little shelf but the area around it is going to be bright, right? So the shelf gets darker because the light doesn't wrap back around and hit it. You know, light goes in, in straight rays. They just got to think in terms of how uh, the light is angled, paint as well as you can to that angle, and then start dark work light. And you don't have to have an airbrush. You can do it with a brush. We've done lots of OSL just with a brush. Airbrush just makes it easy because the blend is so easy to achieve. Blood grooves like a K bar. <laughs> I feel like there's some sort of weird, like, I don't know what the hell. They're cool. I don't know. I don't know. Freaking 40K design. I don't know what it all means. I think that's it for me. I'm probably out of here. It's 4.30. I'm sure Jen and I could probably stand to have a meal. So I will find uh, somebody that we can host off to if there's somebody streaming. Is there any streamers on right now? see let's see let's see let's see let's see let's see let's see genuine genuine streaming what the hell all right we're gonna raid in genuine that's it dumb deal let's go send everybody over to genuine so thank you guys and gals for joining with us we did some cool stuff today i'm out of here we'll be back at our normal time on tuesday i don't know these saturday sunday ones are just kind of up in the air as to if i stream or not so uh we'll see you back here normal time 2 p.m on tuesday if not so thanks for hanging if you like what you're seeing hit that follow button mucho appreciado have a great rest of your weekend and we will catch y'all later adios Thank <laughs> you.